okay so a uh, very good morning to all the friends on brazil side and a good evening and good afternoon to all the indian participants uh, this is professor n k samadhiya i am president indian geotechnical society so i welcome you all for this indo brazilian geotechnical webinar uh, in which we will be having 12 lectures six from indian side and six from brazil side on different aspects of geotechnical engineering so before uh, we start i will give you a brief uh, introduction or brief uh, presentation for uh, in re reference to the indian geotechnical society Uh, all the people at india they know what indian geotechnical society is but for the benefit of the uh, participants from brazilian side i will just briefly uh, introduce this uh, indian geotechnical society so this indian geotechnical society uh, it was uh, it, it was founded on in 1948 as the indian national society for soil mechanics and foundation engineering so it was established in 1948 and the name for this was given in 1970 and this society was affiliated to international society for soil mechanics and foundation engineering which is now soil mechanics and geotechnical engineering so in 1998 we celebrated its uh, diamond jubilee and uh, in 2023 it will be the platinum jubilee of this particular society the objects of the society is to promote a study of soil mechanics rock mechanics foundation engineering engineering geology and allied subjects and to strengthen professional practice through dissemination of technical information and practical experience to provide common forum for academicians researchers designers construction engineers equipment manufacturers and all others now we offer in indian geotechnical society we offer the uh, membership in uh, three forms one is individual member then institutions and then organizations so these organizations include the private organizations and other than the academic institutions now presently we have around 5150 members under various categories and also uh, we honor uh, members with significant contribution by conferring uh, honorary fellowships so there are 23 honorary fellowships fellows so far now the we have got local chapters also and these are spread all over the country uh, which organize conferences seminars symposia workshops webinars annual general sessions and we have presently 48 local chapters and most of the local chapters are very active and they are they in, in this particular pandemic uh, many local chapters and also the students chapters have organized the webinars and also the international webinars so uh, we have uh, instituted as a annual award for the best local chapter depending upon the performance of that particular local chapter we also organize indian Geo young geotechnical engineers conference uh, especially for the members below the age of 35 years and we organize this in once in two years exclusively for young geotechnical engineers we have also organized international activities several international activities have been hosted by indian geotechnical society and the some of them are like 13th international conference on soil mechanics and foundation engineering which was held in new delhi in 1994 and, and it was a great success we have organized so far three asian regional conferences in 1960 75 and then 2007 
Then sixth ASEAN Young Geotechnical Engineers Conference at Bangalore in 2008. And sixth International Conference on Environmental Geotechnics at New Delhi in 2010. And we have also organized first one international event uh, regarding the trans transportation geotechnics very recently in uh, New Delhi in 2018. These IGS members are on several international technical committees, especially uh, we are uh, very well represented in all the TCs of uh, the International Soil ISSMG. Now we have the agreement of cooperation with geotechnical societies of USA, Japan, and Korea. And we have organized joint workshops. So uh, we are expecting uh, such MOU with uh, uh, Brazil also, and we are both, both the sites are working uh, uh, towards that. So this is one of the, one, uh, the, the first webinar is the first step towards that. So we will have cooperation from Brazilian society also. Now we also uh, publish the Indian Geotechnical Journal, which is now in the 50th year and currently being published by uh, Springer. Six issues is being published from 2019 and it has got free online access to all the members of the society. Not only these members, but all, all the members of the uh, uh, other uh, societies which are associated with Indian Geotechnical Society. Now we publish also IGS news, newsletter. We publish uh, in the newsletter article of common interest and from 2019, a short summary of recently awarded doctoral thesis and job openings in geotechnical engineering in academia and industry are also being published. So there are four issues in a year. And to recognize and honor a member who has made significant contribution to geotechnical engineering, IGS instituted a pre prestigious annual lecture in 1978. Uh, so far, 41 eminent, uh, rather 40, 42 eminent geotechnical engineers have delivered these lectures. And the 42nd IGS annual lecture was delivered by Professor T.G. Sitaram from IIT Guwahati. Now, who is also the first speaker in the, in the first session of the webinar today. So he will be presenting. So this is a brief about the Indian Geotechnical Society. Now, as far as this particular webinar is concerned, uh, as I said, uh, we have got uh, 12 uh, speakers six from Brazil side, six from Indian side. So there will be 12 uh, lectures presented. So I hope that this particular activity will be a grand success because now uh, I can see that about 250 uh, participants have already joined. And as I said, there is uh, the, the registered are more than uh, 700. 50. So with this, uh, I stop here and welcome all of you. And now I request uh, Professor Fernando to uh, share his views. Thank you so much. Let's see if I can share my presentation. Yes, I suppose you can see my presentation now. Yes, yes. Good, good. Uh, so, Professor Samadhaya, uh, President of the Indian Geotechnical Society, Professor Babu, uh, all those that have contributed for organizing this webinar, my fellow colleagues from, uh, from India, uh, good evening from all of you, my friends and colleagues from Brazil. Good morning, actually. Uh, we have these eight, eight hours time gap between the, the two countries. I would like to start by saying how 
honored and how excited we are about holding this first Indian Brazilian geotechnical webinar. Uh, I know that our two countries, uh, we have some differences, but as a matter of fact, I think that we have a lot in common. We share close, uh, close relationship in different areas. We have convergency of views in many global issues. And, and also I would add that I would add to that that currently we are also sharing the challenge of uh, facing uh, the global COVID pandemic. And these challenges are, are faced by hard work and global cooperation. And that's exactly what bring us here. I recall that uh, Brazil and India have established relationships uh, in 1948. So there is a long history that goes behind our countries. There has been previous high level visits from Brazil. I believe that most of our former presidents have visited India and that our bilateral trade has uh, increased substantially in the past decades. So there are lots of reasons for really trying to do a very close cooperation in the area of geomechanics. I recall uh, that uh, we have established a strategic partnership between the two countries in 2006. And this is comprising many areas, including science and technology. Uh, I, 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 uh, in respect to that, we have been exchanging research, develop, developments, innovation, uh, both uh, at university level and industry. So it's about time for us to extend this cooperation to the field of geomechanics. Having these, uh, our geotechnical communities together in this joint event organized by IGS and organized by ABMS is really a privilege. And we are considering this an, as an strategic event. I hope that we can see this as the first step towards a more close collaboration. A few words about ABMS. And interesting enough, ABMS is also a very old organization, a very old association. Uh, we uh, have been established ourselves in 1950, just two years after uh, IGS has been created. So we are a 70 years old organization, which for Brazilian standards, it's quite a lot. We are very, a very young country. Our association has about 2,000 members, which is a lot for our population. And we are a very active society. We've got representatives in all regions across Brazil. So it's very interesting because there is a network of collaboration all over the country, and it's a continental country. So this is one of the marks for our strength. We have more than uh, 10 technical committees and somehow our technical committees are mirroring the international committees from ISSMGE. Uh, I would say as a general statement that we uh, participate very actively in the international society. And we also have the privilege of having a former president, Professor Vito Di Mello, who incidentally has all, was also a ranking lecturer. And I think that from there on, we have established this uh, uh, very active international participation. We uh, often bring international conferences to Brazil. Uh, Brazilian uh, professionals are participating in all the international committees from the international society. Uh, and uh, I think, as I mentioned before, it was about time to extend this cooperation more closely uh, with India. And uh, this is what brings us to this uh, three, days, three days webinar. 
six uh, six teams have been selected uh, all considered to be strategic to our countries and uh, i think that our lecturers they will rooted their presentations in the past in the present but they will focus in the future and for covering these six teams we have invited uh, 12 lectures uh, being as professor samadhaya has mentioned six from brazil and six from india uh, the first presentation the first teams uh, it covers infrastructure in india and brazil uh, considering our strength, our limitations, and probably our challenges. I'm sure that it will help us understanding better our own countries. And from there, we're going to extend the presentations to different areas, including foundation engineering, design of dams, ground improvement, rock mechanics, and environmental geomechanics. Uh, it's going to be a quite a broad area covered by this presentation. So I would like to welcome you all for this uh, webinar. And I have, said, I have said that I hope that you all enjoy the meeting and I'll, and I'll uh, leave Professor Samad Haya to introduce our first lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Fernando. So <clears throat> now I will introduce uh, Professor T.G. Sitaram, although he is a very well-known figure in India and abroad, but just for the information of those who doesn't know much about him, he, he is presently director at Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati. He obtained his PhD in civil engineering from University of Waterloo, Canada in 1991. And he also served as the research scientist at Center of Earth Sciences and Engineering in the Department of Petroleum Engineering, University of Texas at Austin, until 1994. Now, since June 1994, he joined Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, and he was senior professor till July two, 2019. And in 2019, he joined uh, IIT Guwahati as the director. He was the founder chairman of a center uh, in infrastructure, sustainable transport and urban planning at ISC Bangalore. Now presently he is the honorary professional fellow at University of Wollongong, Australia from 2019 to 22 and distinct professor at uh, Hankou University uh, International Innov Innovation Center, China. He has published uh, more than 500 papers 20 books, he has guided 40 PhDs, 40 MTech students, and a large number of uh, postdoctoral candidates. He is the chief editor of International Journal of Geotechnical uh, Earthquake Engineering, editor-in-chief, Springer Transactions in Civil and Environmental Engineering, book series, Singapore. He is also a fellow of ASC, IC, a diplomat of uh, geotechnical Engineering from Academy of Geoprofessionals, USA, and fellow of almost all the societies of India like uh, FIE, uh, IGS, ISAT, and ISES. And he was chairman of Research Council of CSIR, Central Building Research Institute, Rurki, till, until 2020. He is governing council member of National Council of Science Museums, Government of India. He is the founder president of International Association of Coastal Reservoir Research, uh, registered in uh, New South Wales, Australia, and continue to guide IC, IACRR in his second term. He is the president of Indian Society for Earthquake Technology, Rurki, and continue to guide ISET for the second term. He is presently the chairman of AICT. Eastern Journal Committee, Regional Office at Kolkata. So uh, he has got many uh, honors uh, with him. Professor T.G. Sitaram delivered prestigious IGS annual lecture during Indian Geotechnical Conference during December 2020. And he also has received IGS Kokelman Award, which is the highest award for uh, contrib contribution in geotechnical engineering 
from the Indian Geotechnical Society. And uh, he has also uh, got several awards from SARC for uh, SARC countries. And he is, as I said, fellow of ASC and holds many other fellowships. He was listed in the world's top 2% of scientists for the most cited scientists in various disciplines by Stanford University in 2020. So with this brief uh, background about uh, Professor T.G. Sitaram, I, I now invite Professor Sitaram to deliver lecture on infrastructure challenges in India in the 21st century. Uh, Professor Sitaram, please. Namaste. Good morning to all friends from Brazil. Good evening, friends of IGS. Let me first of all congratulate IGS and ABMS and also all the responsible people, including the president and secretary of the societies to champion this three day webinar between Indian Geotechnical Society and the Society of Brazilian Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering, ABMS. Again, good morning and good evening, friends. Without wasting time, let me straight away go to my talk. Today, my topic, which was given to me, actually, talk about infrastructure challenges in India in the 21st century. Friends, India's ambition of sustaining its relatively high growth depends on one important factor, that is infrastructure. The country, however, is plagued with a weak infrastructure, incapable of meeting the needs of the growing economy and growing population. India's GDP to grow around 8% for the next three fiscal years, among the fastest in large growing economies, this pandemic, COVID-19, has put a staller. It's really put the economy back in turn and also all the infrastructure work actually came to stand still for some few months. But again, it has taken off. The government aims to significantly boost the manufacturing sector to contribute an all-time high of about very high GDP in the years to come. For India, its road to sustainably higher growth and a competitive manufacturing sector goes through robust and reliable national infrastructure, especially power and transportation. Lacking infrastructure hampers growth and investment. All of us know infrastructure development can in turn support demand for other industrial sectors. So infrastructure is the key. In that infrastructure, geotechnical engineering has a major role to play. I somehow take the word, if you look at the dictionary word meaning of infrastructure is underlying base or supporting structure, something to do with geotechnical engineering. So the basic facilities, equipment, services, and installation needed for the growth and functioning of a country, community, operation, organization, all falls under the domain called infrastructure. So today I'm going to talk to you first, a little bit briefly introduce the issues and challenges for India. And then I will go into some of the two case studies, which I've given in my summary to IGS, saying that two case study where I was myself involved in designing, guiding until construction, which is one of the state of the art two projects, which I will highlight to you in this talk of 40 minutes. I'm going to stick to my time. So the picture what you are seeing here is a new bridge, Bogibil River Bridge, Assam. For friends from Brazil, Assam is a very northeastern part of the country. The boundary between India, the main part of India and Assam is only 2% of the boundary of about 5,000 or 6,000 kilometers, okay, which is connected. Otherwise, we are bounded by all international boundary like uh, Bhutan, China, Myanmar, and uh, on the southern side, Bangladesh. Okay, so this bridge, which was recently inaugurated in December 2018, 
which is five kilometer over the Brahmaputra River. Brahmaputra River is a mighty river, flows from Himalayas and ends up in Bay of Bengal. And let me also take you to, through my institute. I am right now the director of the Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati, which is also on the banks of Brahmaputra River, beautiful campus of 700 acres, which is a, an engineering school initially, but we have expanded into multidisciplinary. We have completed 25 years in 2019. And in the QS World Ranking announced just few days back, IIT Guwahati is number two in India with second highest citation per faculty in India and 41, number 41 in the world in the citation per faculty. Otherwise, in the overall ranking, we are 395, jumped from 470, 75 ranks jumped this year. So I will not go and read all the other things. Only to my friends of uh, Brazil, I wanted to show you where we are. We are Gauhati in the northeastern part of India in the neighboring figure, what you can see in the state of Assam. Okay, You can see Assam is bounded by you know, uh, Bangladesh and then uh, in the north, China and the and there's Myanmar on the east is all. Okay, that's the way where you are. So infrastructure, double and development are interrelated, friends. The link between infrastructure and development is not a once for all affair. Okay, it is a continuing affair. So you need to have development, you need to augment your infrastructure, maintain your infrastructure. It's a continuous process and progress in development has to be preceded, accompanied and followed. So there's a beautiful by progress in infrastructure. Availability of adequate and efficient infrastructural setup not only promotes rapid industrialization, but also improves the quality of life of people. This is what your, our sustainable development goal looks at. Accelerated growth to fulfill aspiration of a large population like in India, 125 crore or 135 crores today. So let me show you some of the important recent infrastructure with very innovative geotechnical input is you know, Atal Tunnel, which was inaugurated by Honorable, Honorable Prime Minister, Sri Narendra Moji ji in October, 2020. This is a, the left one where Honorable Prime Minister himself walking through the tunnel, which is a Atal Tunnel, named after our former Prime Minister. Length is nine kilometer. It is the longest tunnel, about 10,000 feet. So the, it's a, you have to look at that. You know, it is in Himalayas. So very ge geotechnically, very complex terrain. And this is the world longest tunnel at the maximum altitude of the world, which is close to about 3000 meters. The next picture to the right side is the Chinab Bridge where I myself got involved from last close to about 15 years, which is Chinab Bridge, which is in Jammu Kashmir, which today I'm gonna to talk about that bridge and what did we do there, okay? The railway, actually it's a railway bridge, this is going to, once completed, it's going to be the world's highest railway bridge and is expected to complete December 2021. Last month, the arch portion is closed and geotechnical all work, both the stabilization, slope stability, rock bolting, all completed in 2018. Then bottom one, what you can see is the Calcutta Metro Tunnel. It's a beautiful project under the bridge of Howrah one of the oldest Hora Bridge, which is, you know, and it is a twin tunnel underground at 40 meter below the ground, below the river Hooghly. Okay. It will also complete in December, 2021. I was fortunate enough to go into the tunnel during construction along with my friends in Afghans, which is a company which is constructing it. So they are jubilant about this because if the tunnel length is about 11 kilometers and tunnel spacing is very, very small. It's only 16 meter gap between the two tunnels. So you can see, and Kolkata soft clay uh, really makes you hard. And also it is a river below the river Ganges, the, sorry, river Hooghly, which is a tributary to Ganges. So then, you know, in another area where India has done tremendously well is the construction of large dams. India has built close to about 6,000 large dams. Large dam, I don't need to define to this August, uh, community of geotechnical community. Large dam is a dam which holds 1 million meter cube or more 
or 15 meter tall or more or any very unique structure like arch. So today we have constructed 5,700 already, 300 more we are constructing and all in the Northeast in zone five of earthquake zone. So India ranks third in the world in dam building after the United States and China. And we have only stored, even with all this, we have only stored 10% of our average annual rainfall received in the country. So the rest of it, where it is going, which is going during the monsoon into the ocean. India is also leading the global shift towards renewable energy. Today, India's standing in global renewable energy installed capacity, fourth in the wind power, fifth in the solar power, fifth in the renewable energy. Installed capacity in the last four years itself, close to about 75 gigawatts. So you can see the effort of Indian government in bringing the renewables into the foray. In the last four years, government has invested over US dollar 40 billion in green energy space. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a big thing for India. So other you know, Indian infrastructure, building homes, nurturing dreams, where 15 million houses built since 2014, and urban transportation through smart cities, 100 urban centers chosen as smart cities. A lot of work is going on in the urban smart cities program. More roads and highways, greater transformation is happening. 100% electrification of broad gauge routes of Indian railways. I had a chance about just two days back to travel in the North Frontier Railways of the uh, Northeast uh, Rails of, uh, in Assam. It was really amazing. They converted entire Northeast into broad gauge. It all happened in the last 10, 15 years. Railways development on track, less than 100 accidents recorded in a year today. So which was very high earlier. Promising affordable air travel. Ude Deshka Am Nagarik program, Udan, what we call, 102 operational airports are functioning in India. It's amazing. 102, which is drastically different than what we had earlier. Totally, total 136 airport India emerges the world's largest aviation market with 100 million domestic air passenger. This pandemic has hit very hard the airline industry. Harnessing inland waterways to boost connectivity. India's first inland waterways on River Ganga is inaugurated already by the Honorable Prime Minister. Thrust to environment friendly cheaper fuels, that is the gas, LPG gas, is also that, what is that to do with infrastructure? We have to develop city gas distribution pipelines. Significant steps taken to clean Ganga, installation of new sewage treatment plants and toilets, ladies and gentlemen. More than 10 crores household toilets only constructed on, along the Ganga. And 4,465 villages made, you know, free outdoor defecation. All this information can be found in Transforming India by Go. It's a government information which I co collated for you, ladies and gentlemen. The world, the world is seeing a new India in 21st century. Even though we have challenges and even though we have this pandemic, it has a very hard new might of new India is very clearly visible, whether it is in vaccine diplomacy our negotiation with G7, you know, we can very clearly see that the roadmap to India's infrastructure is exciting and futuristic. And it will not be an exaggeration to say that new decade seems to be a promising one for India. According to Indian infrastructure sector, in India industry report, India plans to spend US dollar 1.5 trillion, 1.4 trillion on infrastructure in between period of 2019 to 2023. Government has very clear plans laid out. Infrastructure together with real estate and housing, which are the key economic development, were severely hit due to corona pandemic, friends. However, there have been many bright spots, especially the progressive policy initiative of the government, which bore well for the months ahead. There are some important policy reforms that are in the offing to boost infrastructure development, because that's the one we can bring back to the normalcy after this pandemic COVID-19. So what I would like to tell to my Brazil friends is this one. Some of the India's largest metro regions 
would become the size of many countries in terms of both GDP as well as population. Please understand, I'm not just talking about population. Even in terms of GDP, Mumbai metropolitan region would cross Portugal, Colombia, UAE, Malaysia, Israel, and the, these are not small countries, ladies and gentlemen. And similarly, in the population in 2030, Mumbai is going to be 33 million. Canada, it crosses the population of Canada, Peru, Malaysia, Saudi Arabia, Australia, and Chile. You can see that some of the India's largest metro regions would become the size of many countries. Advantage India is the third largest size GDP, 8.6 trillion. Growth rate is 7.6%, which really affected during the pandemic. Foreign reserves are quite high. Road network, second largest in the world, 33 lakh kilometer. For my friends, 3.3 million kilometers. Railway network, second largest, 2.3 million people travel every day. One of the largest employer of India. Urban population, 377 million people, all related to infrastructure, ladies and gentlemen. Population, one of the one other advantage India has is population between age group of 15 to 64 is close to 80 percent. That is 767 million people are between age and 15 and 64. Very young India. Internet users, that means technology users are 500 million people. So you can see now the opportunities are plenty. Promise of a strong consumer market combined with a large working population. So we don't need to really look outside. We have the both the commodities and the demographics inside. Income levels is expected to triple by 2025. Urban market shall account for two thirds of the consumption growth. Our Indian urban population is also increasing. Working population is also increasing. India as a young nation will our age a median age, which will be 37 years by 2050. That means we are going to be the youngest. So we are going to be the engineers of the world, the global engineers. That's the concept way we are developing. Delhi Mumbai Industrial Corridor is one key which we need to look at it, which is time of goods from, it is to take 14 days to reach from Delhi to Mumbai. It's going to take 14 hours soon, ladies and gentlemen. Estimated investment is 100 billion. Dedicated freight corridor, what it is uh, yesterday, military has started using that. Dedicated freight car, 1,500 kilometers of the backbone. 24 investment regions across these dedicated corridors. Develop eight sustainable industrial cities. One such city is Dolera, Gujarat, 22.5 square kilometer area. Shendra, Maharashtra, 8.39 square kilometer. Integrated township of Greater Noida, Vikram Udyogiri Ujjain. All these are cities which are going to be coming on this infrastructure lines. Everything is under working trunk infrastructure for all the mentioned cities to be completed by 2019 because of the pandemic, two, three years delay is there in this. These are all official information from the Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion, Ministry of Commerce and Industry. I have acknowledged the reference there. Doubling of network of highways, which will be 11,000 kilometers of national highways constructed in March 20, by March 2021. That is not, it's all new and 400 railway stations upgraded. So the railway today, we are very happy to go to our railway stations. Track construction along the dedicated freight corridor, port mine connectivity, high-speed railways work is going on with Japanese collaboration between you know, uh, Mumbai and Ahmedabad. Ports and inland waterways called Sagarmala, which is a vision, visionary you know, plan of 150 billion opportunity, seven greenfield major airports, 44 capacity investment project, 80 port connectivity project, and close to eight dry ports and coastal major ports, 200 other ports and five waterways are all part of this network. 100% FDI allowed for the infrastructure development. Aviation, 80 billion opportunity, dollar 80 billion opportunity, largest market by 2030 in India, is India. 24.6% domestic traffic growth is also envisaged. 250 airports. 111 billion opportunity in smart cities. Focus on affordable housing, which is the dream of our, uh, the present government, Amrut, 
automation for rejuvenation and urban transformation, US dollar 7.5 billion. So we are going to construct and see that by 2023, when we complete 2022, when we complete 75 years of independent India, every, everybody will have their own house. Retrofitting works are also being taken in 500 cities. Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana, 20 million houses by 2022. In phase one, 100 cities have to be taken up. So let me come to my case studies now, where I was got involved myself in one of those projects, Chinab Bridge. This is the site at which in the Himalayas, okay, close to about, uh, there is a station called Last Station, railway station called Katra. From there, it is 40, 45 kilometers. I made a first visit in 2005, ladies and gentlemen. 2007, with a lot of deliberation, they were thinking of changing of alignment. Finally, we start implementing the many, uh, after many breaks in the construction, 2018, and now it is completed. Geotechnical work is completed. Bridge launching is also completed last month. So this project, this will be the world's highest elevated rail bridge called Chinab Bridge across River Chinab in Jammu, state of Jammu, Kashmir. This is comes in a Udampur, Srinagar, Baramulla rail link project. Indian Railways is the owner. Konkan Railways is the agency which is implementing it, but construction done by Messrs. of Khans and the consultant for Messrs. of Khans uh, in this. In Himalayas, active young mountains, sub-zero temperatures, difficult to access, disturbances, new technologies and innovation has been adopted. Everything what has been done is a, uh, is a, uh, uh, really new, something very unique, and they have all uh, global patents. So just to tell you, our friends from uh, Brazil, that this is where the Jammu Kashmir state in the top north, and very close to the state, a city called Riasi, this bridge is coming across the river Chinab. We can see that this is the Chinab bridge, the star ocean, which is Udampur to Banihal. Please note that in already in Srinagar, which is a valley, the trains are running from Kazigan to Banihal to Kazigan, Kazigan to Srinagar trains are already running, but there is no connectivity between the Srinagar to Jammu, that is Banihal through Udampur. This bridge plays a major role connecting this. And you can see that this is from the last station is Katra, which we Honorable Prime Minister United in 2017. So it is an interactive design, ladies and gentlemen, or what you call observational method. Very similarly, you know, what we do in tunnels are coming into this, like an ATM, coming into large projects. So the interactive design is currently sort of very clearly undefined, PC206, last time I had a workshop or a conference. So an interactive geotechnical design is a design approach requires design refinement throughout the project execution period until a suitable technique and optimum scheme are applied to the problem at hand. That's what we have followed here. And this is a mountainous terrain, and a lot of stabilization of slope is inevitable in the following project, even to access the both abutments before even constructing the bridge. So design as you go is the adopted methodology, interactive geotechnical design with a lot of geotechnical investigation, analysis, and that is how our involvement is not one time from continuously from 2005 to 2018, I was involved with our team from Indian Institute of Science. Problem statement, highly jointed rock mass in a very difficult terrain like Himalayas, young mountains of the world, predominantly in the Himalayan region where the ground is subjected to severe tectonic activity due to pushing of the Gondwana land into Eurasian plate. The seismic activity is still present, highly jointed rock mass. Rock mass is not intact, close to soil from strength point of view, but younger, what we call younger dolomite. It's also it's like a limestone. There may be a huge cavities inside. We found a couple of them at the site. The analysis of the slopes and assessment of safe bearing capacity of foundation coming on the slopes involve elaborate work, treating the strata as continuum on one hand and discrete material on the other. So we have adopted both discrete element modeling and finite element modeling for doing the slope stability, including the limit equilibrium approaches. Analysis has become very cumbersome and very expensive because as we go every step, you can see the, the right side picture very clearly shows you the, how the foundation is being laid after excavating the entire slope of almost 215 meters and every foundation has been placed at, with rock bolting. 
Our scope was determination of intact and rock mass properties for the analysis, design of slopes in jointed rock mass, suggestion for the appropriate parameters based on the detailed geotechnical investigation for the design of slopes in jointed rock mass, determination of the stability of slopes and suggestion uh, for the appropriate stability analysis and stabilization methods, lay down the principle of design as you go and bring out detailed methodology of implementation of developed methodology in the field. So this is the, ladies and gentlemen, 362 meter above the riverbed level of Chinab. And it's uh, the main arch span is 467 meters and you, it is taller than the Eiffel Tower. This is the step what we have slope profile on the left, left abutment. And the, this is the right abutment and the duck is connected close to 1.4 kilometer, the bridge is. So this is before excavation and the right side is the, the left abutment, uh, left bank and the 215 meter high excavation. Excavation included 0.6 million cubic meters, rock bolting 33,000 running meter, shot creating is 50,000 square kilometer, square meter. And similarly on the right side, you can a little bit better, 124 meter excavation, rock bolting is 31,000 running meter, shot creating is 15,000. Double cor corrosion protection, uh, diabetic bars installation, you can see very beautifully done and it is every below the foundation, every foundation below that, this is a uh, Davidic bar bolted installation done and all design is ours. This was the soil before, before commencement of work. You can see the Chinab river and, and it's a very difficult terrain, no access of roads. Everything has to be done from scratch. And, and we have started geological investigations with the several companies and we are guiding from the beginning, logging, pits, and also audits, everything we have done here, what can be done? Joint orientations we have measured and, and geological log of the pit, geological log of the drift, and highly fractured dolomite joint spacing is between 20 millimeter to 500 millimeter, joints filled with silty sand and silty gravel, presence of open joints and cavities, RQD is zero to 10%, RMR is 35 to 40, UCS is 16 to 62 megapascal. So such a variation where permeability is greater than 50 lusions. There is no groundwater associated. That's a good thing. We did a lot of geotechnical tests, safe bearing capacity, plate dot, plate load test, in-situ box shear test, borehole data, RQD, UCS, RMR, borehole, then plate load test, dilatometer, MSW, tomography. All, all these tests are done at several foundation locations along the slope and PHA and PVA values used, this is the design basis, 0.36G, peak horizontal maximum credible earthquake, design basis earthquake is 0.18G. So this is the real earthquake, which we have applied on the slope. Important analysis, minimum factor safety we achieved was 1.5 with static loads, 1.2 with static and DBE, and static and MCE is one. Pore water pressure, there is no groundwater, but still RU, Factor 0.3 is considered in the analysis. Differential settlement of foundation was limiting, should be less than 20 millimeter. That's the trick. Numerical programs adapted for the benefit of young ones, dips, rock signs, and the swedge, rock signs, continuum approach, pseudostatic, flag, slide, and then hook and bray analysis of the toppling also done. Approach roads is the one greater event we have done here. So look at the kind of approach roads to reach the apartments of both thing. Making approach roads itself took a lot of time. So the shot creating, and you can see how it was, what a jet was cleaned, the surface, shot created, rock bolted, and the surface is ready. Like these steps are done, you know. So uh, drilling of rock bolts, you can see installation of rock bolts, and this is what double corrosion protection rock bolts below S60 foundation. So let me take you to another very interesting project where I'm only sort of a committee member. It's a towards achieving a 1000 year design life, ladies and gentlemen, construction of Sri Ram temple at Ayodhya. It's very close to the majority of the Indians. So there are a lot of options were given like stone column, draft with stone column, pile draft foundation. And you know, the committee deliberated several times. And finally, for this beautiful, magnificent structure, which is to sustain thousand years design life, uh, sufficient to resistant structural loads, seismic forces and environmental forces, 
a open excavation with shallow foundation on improved ground was suggested by the committee where i was also one of the part member and see that settlement due to superstructure is almost very small 10 mm because superstructure is a like a interlocking rocky sandstone rocky structure no steel is used in this project and no concrete is used some portion of small cement is used temporarily another important project which is under way which will take a lot of time kalpasar a gujarat india's world's largest reservoir which is under construction it's going very slow for establishing a huge freshwater coastal reservoir in the gulf of kutch that's where the gulf of kutch ladies and gentlemen in gujarat state north of mumbai okay this is a completely a, a water uh, storage structure for fresh water developmental project mainly for water resources for creation of fresh water in gulf of kambar for meeting demand of irrigation domestic and industrial water supply 30 km sea dam in the sea it is constructed with 10000 million cubic meter of storage how much 10000 million cubic meter is going to be the one of the largest reservoir in the world but if it breaks unlike the large dams it will simply go to the ocean that's the beauty of this coastal reservoir so it is equating to 25% that is one fourth of gujarat's average annual rainwater flow for saurashtra and central gujarat regions of india so this is uh, for the people from france from brazil this is where it is see you see goa here north of goa this location and this has a beautiful concept that if once done it will have a contour canals three contour canals to irrigate the entire kutch so kalpasar command area would be entire gujarat so this is going to be a phenomenal project which once constructed and also if you are able to store so much of good water so just for the friends to understand what is coastal reservoir coastal reservoir is the reservoir which is used to store water which is going to last to the sea so coastal reservoir is a water supply option for urban areas because i will tell you friends you know what whatever india has built large dams in another 100 years this concrete or these dams except the earth dams most of these concrete dams are not going to stay because concrete is a material has a lifetime of 100 to 150 years so after that you need to look at the alternatives so what are the futuristic like in 2150 what is our grand grandchildren are going to drink water from or use the water for irrigation so this is what is the potential of the coastal reservoir this is going to be in the ocean so india has about 8000 kilometers of ocean so we have a fantastic storage capacity of close to 39000 km cube only using another of 10% maybe 10% we are using now storing rain rain all the annual rainfall another 10% we can store with all kinds of this sarovar wala ma concept which is 20 times more than the demand so then you know we can be canada so canadians are the only country which has you know even 12 years they don't receive any rainfall can survive with water so our book our concept was accepted by the international body wwdr 2020 united nations un water has accepted and this has appeared coastal reservoir as a water supply option for urban area in this book in 2019 and our new book in lcvr uh, seven seven of them seven of us are authors myself is the first author sustainable water resource development using coastal reservoir i will bring it to your notice it is only come in 2020 this is a very new book and it is available online in lcvr book so this what is this international association coastal reservoir research so this has a great potential so the you, the beauty of it you can note down even though i only started this with our friends from australia but now the past president of iahr past president of international water association past president of iwra past president of iih are all vice president with me that clearly shows they are all convinced about the importance of coastal reservoir in the future so let me also take you my own research areas of traditional earthquake resistant building designs in india see these are the conventional tradition we have left this and going into the concrete one and we are sitting in a earthquake zones you can see we are having a lot of seismic gaps and zone 5 particularly you know the area where my institute is there is completely in red that means it is zone 5 which is very high amplitude the, this is happening because collision of indo australian plate to the eurasian plate in a region of greatest continental tectonic deformation of the world 
15% of the great earthquakes have happened there in the 20th century. It's going to happen even in the 21st century. When you build infrastructure, we need to build considering the design earthquake conditions. A large magnitude of earthquake is due to seismic gap in the Himalayas. Last 100 years, people are complacent. They have not seen the earthquakes. So they think that they're not going to hit us anywhere. So we are not ready, really. We are, our community is not ready. Okay, we need to prepare our community and also prepare our buildings. So Indian Society for Earthquake Technology, Roorkee, is doing a lot of this kind of activities with almost close to 3,000 members, which is also founded in 1962, for which I'm the president of this society. So our Honorable Prime Minister has also put 10-point agenda on disaster risk reduction. Mainstreaming disaster risk reduction in the infrastructure development is also one of the focus wherein this today's topic is a very relevant. Traditional earthquake resistant building systems in India, which I showed you in the previous slide, today we are adopting earthquake resistant design, even in a Bhuj earthquake. Now we have, our, our engineers are ready to design any kind of building. We need to only identify the hazard. So let's create an earthquake resilient society, ladies and gentlemen, and Indian Geotechnical Society and Brazilian society has a major role to play in this direction. I invite all of you, to attend 7th International Congress on Recent Advances in Geotechnical Earthquake Engineering, which is supposed to happen last year in Bangalore. And, but due to pandemic, we have to postpone. And this is coming next month, July 12th to 15th online. And we have fantastic 30 speakers, one of the top-notch researchers from America, uh, all over the world, actually. You know, you can go to the website, seventhikraji.org, this is the seventh in the series. Five of these conferences were held in uh, USA, and the sixth one was in Delhi. Seventh one was supposed to be in Bangalore, but this time we are doing holding it online. We are going to do with a very fantastic three-dimensional platform. What you're seeing is the, the platform. So this is the new platform which has come, and you can go into go to program at Glance Scientific. So registration is open. The fee is very very minimal. Please join all of you both from Brazil and India, I invite all of you to join. And thanks and questions, any questions, please. Before that, I would like to say India's contribution on yoga, International Yoga Day is coming next week. 21st of June is an International day, Yoga Day. And I think Brazil loves conducting yoga sessions. So I invite all of them to join for the International Yoga Day. Happy International Yoga Day, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Namaskar. Professor Samadhya, I finished right on time at six o'clock, 5.40 minutes. Yes, yes. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. So, uh, uh, dear participants, uh, let us thank and appreciate the efforts of Professor T.G. Sitaram. And he has finished uh, this lecture within the stipulated time. And he has showcased the complete infrastructure, what infrastructure is there in India and what infrastructure is required in future. And he has also gone through uh, some of the case studies, especially uh, the Chena Bridge. And he is also associated with the most awaited construction of uh, Sri Ram Temple and India's uh, largest coastal <laughs> reservoir in the Gulf of Khambat. So he has highlighted uh, the infrastructure projects which are now running and as well as we, which are the requirements for the strong uh, future of India. So that will be, he has termed this as new might of a new India. So thank you very much, uh, Professor T.G. Sitaram for this mesmerizing lecture. And uh, for the discussion, we will be having discussion after the second lecture. So I request you to be kindly available during that. Uh, thank you so much. Now I uh, hand over the platform to Professor Fernando uh, for the second lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you, Namaskar. Professor Sitaran, thank you very much for your lecture. Very interesting and comprehensive starting. And now we're gonna move to the Brazilian speaker. Fernando Laser Gonçalves. Uh, Fernando is a civil engineer. He's graduated 
at the University of Pol the Polytechnic School of Sao Paulo, which is the heart of Brazil, where he also uh, got his uh, Master of Science Geotechnical Engineering degree. That was back in 2001. Uh, Fernando Laser is specialized in tunnels and underground structure constructions. And he was uh, very active at CBT, the Brazilian Tunneling Committee, working as vice president from 19 to 2020 and treasurer from 2015 to 2018. Uh, he, works as, he works as an engineering director for Andrade Gutierrez Engineering, uh, which is one of the biggest infrastructure and heavy construction contractors in Brazil. Uh, so we're very lucky, luck, we're very lucky on having the opportunity of sharing his experience. And we would like to thank Fernando Laser to accept our invitation to deliver this lecture on infrastructure challenges in Brazil in the 21st century. Fernando, please, you can start. Hey, so uh, uh, good evening to our dear friends in India. Good morning to our friends in, in Brazil. Uh, uh, I'd like to thank you, Professor Fernando, for, for the invitation. Uh, this, this presentation uh, is, is quite a challenge, not be, because only of the infrastructure uh, challenge we, we are facing in our country, uh, but uh, uh, after uh, uh, Professor T.J. Sitaran presentation, it will be a more uh, 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 a big challenge to me to present to present this this material. So, uh, oh, sorry. So this is our agenda. Uh, I'm I'm not uh, showing you showing to you. Uh, any uh, specific project, uh, but uh, an overview of uh, the, our infrastructure uh, challenge for the next uh, years. Uh, I'm not talking about the, the whole center, of course, <laughs> but uh, for the next years, we have uh, a lot of uh, infrastructure challenges uh, and projects to build in Brazil. So uh, we, we will talk about about uh, uh, what's going on in Brazil, a macroeconomic aspect of Brazil, also macro social aspect, just uh, quite shortly. Uh, then uh, I, will, I will talk about uh, the, our infrastructure challenges and uh, we, uh, I will focus on uh, uh, three, three main important issues, transportation logistics, uh, energy generation, and water and sewage. So uh, Brazil is a big country uh, with more than uh, 8 million square kilometers, uh, a population about uh, 210 million people. Uh, we, our country is divided in five big regions as you can see in the map, uh, the, the green one is the north, where we had the, our rainforest, the Amazon. The yellow one is uh, northeast region. We have a, 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 a center west uh, a region, the southeast region uh, is the mo most more populated region where we, we have the big cities, Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, and Belo Horizonte, and a south region. So when we talk about uh, uh, some economic aspects from Brazil, uh, we, we see the first, the first graphic here is the, our G, GDP uh, growth. Uh, as you can see, we, we, 
We have faced an uh, economic crisis in the last five years. And you can see here, last year, the, the effect of the pan pandemic situation. But uh, uh, we are waiting for uh, a growth, you know, a GDP growth in the next uh, 10 years, about 2.8%, uh, 3% uh, per year in the next 10 years. So, uh, in, uh, talking about investment, we, we expect also an, a growth in the investment rate and a GDP investment rate. So, we, we hope by the, the, the period between uh, 2026 and 2030, uh, we I expand of 20% of the GDP in, in, in investments. And uh, when you look at, uh, uh, at our uh, industries, uh, we, can, we can divide this GDP growth uh, uh, between agribusiness, industry, and services. Just take a look, the first look of the, on the oops, agribusiness uh, industry. You can see that uh, even uh, with a crisis, if in this pandemic situation, the agribusiness is still growing and you will be growing for the next 10 years. Uh, in, this, in this map, uh, we can see the agribusiness growth in the last, uh, let's say, 50 years. Uh, it is an example uh, of the soy, soy production expansion between 1974 to, to 2015. And you can see uh, uh, that uh, in the beginning, in the, in the 1970s, uh, the production, the soy production uh, are concentrate, was concentrated in the south of Brazil and the expansion and the big expansion in the, in the whole country uh, of the, the soy production. Uh, soy is just an example, it's the, 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 the major example because uh, we are the biggest uh, soy producer in the world. It's an important uh, agriculture for us. Another, another uh, point here is the, just take a look in the, in the industry sector. Uh, our industry was very affected by, by the, the economic crisis and the, the pandemic situation, but uh, uh, we expect for the next 10, ten years uh, also a, a, GD, a GDP growth in this sector. Uh, some some parts of the, uh, some specific industries are very important, and I will present you uh, some details of this this industry. Uh, oil and gas is one uh, important industry, and mining is also important industry for infrastructure. When you, when you we take a look at the oil and gas production, we expect. Uh, uh, a big growth in the in the oil production here in the, the right side, and also a gas uh, uh, production in this in the in the left side. Uh, it's important to 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 keep this uh, gas production in mind when we talk about uh, uh, electric energy generation. We will talk about this later. In, in this uh, gas production is very important for this energy generation. Most of this, this increase is based on the pre-salt uh, uh, oil fields that we had discovered in, uh, uh, between 10 and 15 years ago. And this is important for this, this growth. Other, the other industry, 
this very important in Brazil is the mining industry. Uh, you can see uh, that the mining activities are spread all over the country. We have some concentration, historical concentration here in the, the south, south east and center of Brazil. And we have a big concentration of mining activities in the north, in the Pará state, where Vale, uh, Vale is the biggest uh, mining company in the world. They have a lot of activities in mines here in north of Brazil, especially here in this part of, of Pará state, where we have, for instance, uh, the Carajás mining complex. Well, when, when we see the, the macro social aspects, Brazil seems like a small country when we compare to, to India, of course, but uh, we are still one of the biggest countries in the world. Uh, we, are, we, we have something like the 211, uh, uh, 211 million people in Brazil and we expect a uh, population growth uh, to 225 million uh, people by 2030. At the same time, we can see in the in this graph uh, below, in the left, uh, the urbanization rate, uh, how our our population uh, turn to from rural to urban population. Today. Uh, today we have something like 85% uh, of the total population of the country living in urban areas, uh, especially in the, the southeast, 93% of the population live in, this, in these urban areas, and uh, uh, northeast we have 73% even though it's, uh, it's a, a big rate for, for urban population, and uh, we're still uh, growing this, this urban uh, population. And it's, this is a very important issue when we talk about uh, infrastructure for, for, for our uh, population life quality. So, with this, with this uh, uh, population living in, in urban areas, you can see that uh, almost one third of the total population of the country are living in only uh, 48 cities, uh, all of them with uh, more than uh, 500,000 people. So uh, uh, we have a, a very big concentration of the population in uh, too few uh, uh, cities. So, to support the, the uh, our economic activities, uh, uh, our economic growth, and, and to support the the quality of uh, our population life, uh, I'll, I'll show you some details of uh, four. Uh, infrastructure issues that I think uh, uh, are very important. They are not all the, the infrastructure issues that we are facing, but in my opinion, are the most important. Uh, transportation and logistics, uh, energy generation, uh, sanitation, water service and sewage treatment, and urban mobility. Uh, just to, to start to talk about these issues, let's take a look at this, uh, uh, this table. When we have a comparative data uh, from the BRICS uh, countries uh, in terms of infrastructure, when you, 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 when you look at the, the international or world infrastructure quality ranking, uh, uh, Brazil is number 78. It's, it means we have quite a poor infrastructure quality compared to other countries. 
uh, I, I would like to highlight the transportation uh, uh, numbers and the energy numbers. Uh, when you see the transportation and the highways, only 13% 13 of our highways are paved. Compared to China, for example, where they have 84% of the highways paved. Uh, in highways, we, we have only 3.2 uh, thousand kilometers of, of highways per, uh, per, uh, uh, per square kilometers. Compared to India, it's almost 15% of, uh, of, of India uh, railway density. So we, are ve we have a, a very uh, poor railway infrastructure installed. When, you see, when we talk about energy, uh, the total uh, capacity installed in Brazil is uh, 126 gigawatts. When you compare to China, India, Russia, uh, it's a small, a small capacity installed. All this, these issues uh, are important if you have, if you need to, to to grow our economic activity, we need to, to improve our infrastructure a lot. So let's take a look at the transportation logistics scenarios. Uh, our, our baseline scenario uh, made by the, the Ministry of Infrastructure in Brazil you can see that 64% uh, of uh, the transportation model is uh, based on highways. I'm talking about cargo transportation, okay? Not passengers, just uh, to clarify. And only 20% uh, uh, of the transportation made by railways. We also have 7% uh, in waterways, 3% in cabotage, and 6% in, in pipes, pipelines. Uh, but we, when we look at the carbon dioxide emission, so the, uh, despite the highways had 64% of the total transportation, the highways are responsible for 85% of the total emission. It's a lot. Uh, and railways only eight percent and uh, when you see the when you look at the the operational cost the situation is even worse 91 percent of the total operational cost is based on the the highway uh, transportation mode the only five percent uh, uh, by highways sorry, by highways. So for 2025, the, uh, the Minister of Infra Infrastructure expects to change a little bit or quite a lot the scenario. So our challenge is to improve uh, railways uh, uh, split in, from 20% to 31%. Uh, waterways from seven to nine percent, and uh, cabotage from three to eleven percent. So, uh, still the highways will be the most important. We have a, a quite a big uh, highway infrastructure installed in Brazil, but uh, uh, we we our challenge is to improve the railways and cab cabotaging waterways models. This is a comparison, a comparison between uh, Brazil and other the big countries in terms of railways. Uh, as you can see, we, we transport one tenth of uh, the total uh, cargo transportation, uh, uh, cargo transported by railways in China and in Russia. 
uh, when you see the maps, uh, our railway infrastructure is very small compared to the other countries. This, is, uh, this map shows uh, the existing uh, railway, railways in Brazil and also the, the main projects uh, projected for, for the next years. Uh, you can see uh, in the map the Greenfield project, the new projects are based in the, in the inner country. No? It's, uh, if you remember the maps where I had showed the, the mining activities at the, and the agribusiness activities, these projects uh, are important to improve uh, the logistics of the agribusiness activities and the mining activities. So the main projects for the next years in Brazil are all in, in the middle of the country, in the north part and uh, in the, the center-west uh, part of Brazil. Uh, those projects uh, represent uh, a big challenge when you when you talk in the in the, when you talk about a railway here in the north of Brazil, we are talking about uh, uh, construct a railway in the rainforest. You know? So this is not easy. Uh, when you change from railway to car to ports, uh, to to uh, water transportation to cabotage. We expect uh, a big growth in the, in the cargo uh, transportation for the next decades. You know, the total, the total, uh, uh, the total. Talking about million tonnel, tons, the total transport uh, uh, transportation expected uh, is almost uh, double in the next forty years. Or in all, all kinds of, uh, of uh, cargo will be increased in, in the next years. And the uh, most impressive uh, increase is expected for the next five years here in the, in the beginning. So we expect until 2025 uh, a, a growth in the, in the, in the cargo transportation for, by ports more than 3% per year. And then uh, uh, after that, uh, uh, something like 1% uh, per year until 2060. So for, for this challenge, we have uh, a lot of projects, uh, port terminals specifically. Uh, we have uh, already uh, 23 projects awarded or existing projects extended uh, by the Investment Partnership Program in, in Brazil and other 30 projects uh, that will be included uh, in, this, in this program for the next years. So we expect for the next five, five to 10 years, uh, a lot of uh, uh, port terminals projects uh, being being constructed in Brazil. So let's move to to energy generation. Uh, this first table uh, uh, shows the energy consumption growth uh, from now to 2030, and we expect a, a, a final a final energy consumption increase for. 259 uh, uh, gigataps to 328 gigataps until 2030. And uh, uh, increase also in, in the per capita consumption. It's not uh, uh, only a growth because the population is growing, but uh, also uh, bigger uh, consumption per capita. So uh, uh, all the, 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 
the sectors or, or the activities will be increased in this in this uh, period. Uh, but in this graphic, you can see the most important increase is in the transportation uh, sector. Mm? This is the, the, the blue one. Okay. So when when we when we split the the how this energy is generated uh, in 2019, 38.9 uh, percent of the total uh, energy consumption uh, was by uh, oil, you no know, petroleum fuel. Then we have. Uh, 18.1% by electricity, 7.9% uh, by cane derivatives, 8.4% by uh, firewood and charcoal, 4.7% uh, by mineral coal and derivatives, and 69 uh, by natural gas. Uh, for 2030, we expect uh, uh, a growth in the natural gas uh, consumption, no, and also in electricity. And uh, we expect that uh, the oil consumption will be a little bit uh, uh, smaller than, than today. This uh, this generation is based on uh, the electricity generation is based on this uh, main, main kinds of uh, plants. Uh, today, uh, the most important are hydroelectric power plants. We have a, a, a big tradition in hydroelectric power plants with 63% of the total electricity generation capacity. Then we have thermal power plants with 14%. Uh, uh, wind and, uh, and solar power plants uh, with 11%. It's already a big, a big percentage for these renewable uh, sources. Uh, biomass power plants, 8%, and small hydroelectric power plants, 4%. Uh, we expect uh, uh, for the next five years uh, the, an, an decrease in the thermal power plants capacity and a big increase in the uh, renewable uh, wind and solar power plants. We are already constructing a lot of uh, so solar and wind power plants in Brazil. Uh, and and uh, we are not constructing any hydroelectric power plants. Uh, hydroelectric power plants face big uh, environment uh, problems or challenges. So uh, big construction, very expensive, uh, many years to construct and uh, we, wind and, and solar power plants, you can construct very, very fast and uh, it's not so expensive. So by, by, by 2030, uh, we expect more decrease in the, in the thermal power plants. It's important uh, issue. We, we will be less dependent of thermal power plants in the future. So uh, this, is, uh, this is quite interesting because we have today uh, two big uh, uh, challenges for infrastructure. To keep uh, constructing wind and solar power plants, this will be dominating the energy generation uh, uh, market in the next years. But even though we have a decrease in the, in the thermal power plant's capacity, uh, we do have a lot of 
new projects in this in this area and that's what i show you in the next slide uh, today uh, something like a half of the the thermal power plant's capacity installed is based on natural gas but to have a, a big percentage uh, based on oil and coal power plants. So the challenge for 2030, it's almost uh, 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 change that scenario and use the natural gas that we are producing in the pre-salt oil, uh, oil fields, oil and gas fields, and have no more uh, oil, thermal power plants, and uh, uh, a small amount of coal uh, uh, power plants. So that means uh, we will have, yes, uh, 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 a lot of uh, thermal power plants uh, constructing in Brazil in the next years, all of them based on natural gas fuel. And, and we will uh, stop to use the oil and coal, and coal uh, power plants. This is a very important uh, for the environment. So let's move on to water and sewage. Uh, in, the, in the map on the, the left side, you can see a photograph of uh, Brazil today. Uh, in terms of water service, 83.7% eight, of the Brazilian population uh, uh, are served by water, has water, uh, represent one, 170 a million people. Uh, and we have also uh, uh, different distributions in the, in the regions. 91% here in the, the, the Southeast, but only 57% of the, the North population of Brazil uh, have uh, treated water or drinkable water uh, in their houses, their homes. And we also have almost 40% of water loss in the distribution system. It's quite a lot uh, uh, of loss. When when you look at the sewage scenario, is even worse. Uh, almost half of the total population uh, are served by by sewage uh, collection and and treatment. Uh, again, when you see the north of of the country, only 12% of the population has uh, sewage uh, treatment in their house. And, and the, tot the total uh, uh, sewage uh, collect that we are, uh, that is treated is only 49% uh, of this sewage. So we have a big challenge to change this this scenario. This, I think, uh, is the most important issue uh, when you when you uh, uh, think about uh, uh, life quality. It's the first step: water and sewage. So, we have a new sanitation uh, uh, regulation approved uh, last year, and we expect uh, with this new regulation to, to change this scenario. The goals are very important. We expect by 2030 to have 99% of the population served by water, 90% no? uh, uh, served by, uh, uh, by sewage, collected and treated. And uh, we expect to have uh, no more than 20% of water loss in the distribution system. 
So we, we, we are starting a lot of projects uh, uh, around the country uh, in this, in this uh, water and sewage matters. Uh, and we expect to have many constructions in the next, in the next 10 years and uh, especially in the next 10 years. Okay. So the last, the last issue is human mobility. This is the, uh, my last uh, slide. Uh, it's a, a actual photograph of, of, uh, of uh, passenger transportation modes in, in the human, urban areas. Uh, we, when you take a look at Sao Paulo, Sao Paulo is the biggest city in, in, in Brazil. Uh, we have 400 uh, kilometers of uh, different kinds of uh, mobility transportation transportation modes. When you, when you talk about the metro subway, uh, this blue uh, part of the graph is uh, of the bar is only 100 kilometers. When, when we compare with other, other cities the same size, we always compare Sao Paulo with Mexico City, for, for example. It's, it's a city very similar to Sao Paulo in terms of uh, population. They have more than 400 kilometers of metro. We have only in Sao Paulo 100. And uh, when we look at the other big cities in Brazil, uh, we have we, a big challenge to change this, this scenario. So this is an important issue uh, for the big cities in Brazil. Uh, this uh, uh, this uh, mobility uh, problem is uh, a big challenge. 46% uh, of the, this uh, mode, this, uh, let's say this map is based on urban trains or suburban trains, 28% uh, by uh, B, uh, bus rapid tra uh, transit, B BRT, 19% uh, by metro, only 6% by, by uh, light rail trains. So uh, also a uh, big, big challenge and concentrated quite a few cities. I show you before uh, that uh, we have 48 cities with more than 500,000 people. And only these, these cities have uh, showing this map as a uh, uh, mobility uh, system installed. So that's, that's uh, what I would like to, to show you. And thank you very much. I'm, I'm waiting for your questions. Professor Fernando, thank you very much. Hey, sir. Thank you very much for this very comprehensive view about uh, Brazilian infrastructure. You have brought to us highlighting the strength, limitations, and challenges that we face in Brazil, uh, also including the life quality, sustainability, and renewable energy sources. So for me, it was very interesting, and I understand that uh, our Indian colleagues have also benefited a lot from that. As I mentioned before, I think that after these two presentations, we have a better picture of our countries. So thanks a lot, indeed. Uh, Professor uh, Samanhaya, I think that we can now move to, uh, to questions. Uh, perhaps we can uh, share the questions among ourselves to our speakers. And I, I would say that I have received a number of questions. So if you allow me, I would uh, uh, make the first one and then you follow from there. Can it be this way? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, please. Okay. Perfect. So the first question was to Dr. Sitaran. 
and uh, it uh, comes from uh, Professor Luis Guilherme de Mello, and it's about the project of the Shinagar uh, Bridge. And the questions was uh, related to the possibility of giving details on the characteristics of the rock boats that have been used, uh, the design loads and the quality control methods. And with these questions, I would ask you to, if you could broaden up and give us a better picture on the standards in India regarding this type of design. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dimalo. This is a very good question because uh, as I told you, Indian courts doesn't have for this kind of rock bolts any, no courts are there. For this kind of rock bolts, they are actually uh, high capacity divisic uh, rock bolts. So the company has adopted British standards. Uh, the first to answer your question, company has adopted British standards and quality of, uh, the, it is executed by an international player. Okay, the construction has been done by the international player jointly with Afghans. And then uh, it is installed at these locations and mm -hmm. continuous monitoring and testing of these rock bolts are also done. Full out capacity is also done. Very meticulously planned and executed project in this project. So this is all I can say because I was not at the site all the time. I used to visit, just to tell you, Professor Dimalo, I come from Bangalore. Uh, southern part of India, it is about 3,000 kilometers or 2,500 kilometers from the site where it is. So maybe I have visited about 35 times in the span of about 15 years. I hope I Professor want Sikram, as my as my father was from India, uh, I was at Bangalore and I was at Srinagar also. I, I know a little bit of India. <laughs> <laughs> so I have visited about uh, 30 times. So I hope you have answered your question. See, it is yes, very meticulously done. An international player was involved in uh, designing uh, as well as uh, building. We were only checking their designs and doing a slope stability analysis. So the company was hired by Messrs. Subcards, which is a Mumbai based Thank company. you very much. Can I can I then uh, make make a following up of this uh, of the same subject? Uh, I've got a couple of questions. One is from uh, Paulo Franca, and the other is from uh, Arsenio Negro, both Brazilians and both uh, asking similar questions. The first one is regarding uh, the instrumentation in the boats in the abutments to verify long term performance. And the second one is uh, in the Shenab River Bridge project. What type of observation measurements were undertaken to perform the interactive design? Can you make some comments on that? Yeah. So this uh, interactive design uh, was done with continuous geotechnical investigation, interfering at every foundation as we excavate. Please understand, we have done through top-down approach. That means we started excavating at the top and then rock bolting, and then coming down. So the major challenge was access roads to those foundations. And then foundation was created. So at every step, the when bolting was done, testing was also been involved, both geotechnical and rock pullout testing. Pullout testing behavior was also been uh, for the bolts, okay? And uh, prior to the even uh, excavation, we have uh, added and geological logs, pits, and uh, mapping and uh, continuous surveying has also been adopted here. So, and uh, we, I, I did actually discuss in one of my slides what kind of geotechnical investigations we have done. And monitoring wise in the future, once the bridge is operational, also slope monitoring and then uh, settlement gauges. And then um, uh, even though there is no water, they're also putting the poor, poor pressure sensors, okay? And then uh, they're also putting in kilometers. Yeah. 
Yeah, there are two questions for uh, uh, Fernando Laser. One is from uh, Bruna. The question is, is the heavy construction industry in Brazil expecting a positive change in the average of GDP growth after all the private concessions and state reforms? So this is the question to uh, yeah. Fernando. Uh, uh, so yes, I, I believe uh, this GDP growth in the next years are uh, based on this plan uh, with the private uh, participation in the investments and also the, the, the main state reforms that we, we, we need in the country. Yeah, so yes, this GDP is, is related to this, these issues. Uh, I don't know if I, I, I have answered uh, but uh, so there is me, yes. there is another question to you only. Uh, this is from Paulo Franca. Uh, question is: Don't you think that Brazil has enough capacity to increase its production on renewable energies, wind and solar, in a greater extent than planned by the government? Yes, uh, in fact, uh, we are increasing our our uh, production in terms of renewable energies. Uh, the question is that uh, uh, we still need uh, uh, more uh, better regulations, especially in in the free uh, in the free market, in the free energy market. Uh, we have two kinds of uh, energy markets, the regulated market, regulated by the government with uh, fixed uh, prices for this energy. And we have also a free market uh, with the increasing of this free market. Uh, I think uh, it's, it's a lot of space uh, for new investments uh, in this kind of uh, uh, energy production. The only issue uh, today for these renewable uh, energies uh, is that uh, for we need wind and we need uh, sun. So, so uh, we cannot uh, generate all the time. So uh, that means that we still need the other types of energy generation systems like thermal power plants and hydroelectric power plants. Uh, but uh, of course, we will increase a lot in the next years our production in renewable energies. Uh, just as an example, uh, my company is uh, at this moment uh, constructing uh, constructing more than two giga uh, watt of uh, solar power plants at the same time. So it's it's increasing, and we will increase it more in the next years. Uh, I hope so. Uh, <laughs> I hope so. Okay. Thank you, sir. Now, there is one uh, question for Professor Sitaram uh, by uh, K. Premlata. Why pore pressure ratio is considered as 0.3? I, I told actually, anyway, if you are not followed, pore pressure ratio generally in kind of soft top soils, okay, is about uh, 30%. And here, it is almost like a soil only. Even though it is a jointed rock mass, we say, but uh, the joints were 50 millimeter or less. Okay, it's almost like a broken pieces of like powdery material. So it is only for a safety consideration we have taken, not for anything. Otherwise, pore pressure is not there. I told you, there is no permeability is also very high, illusions and above. So the issue of pore water pressure affecting the uh, the analysis was not there. But as a safety measure, we had, uh, it is actually a constraint from the designer. The designer, uh, the, the, sorry, the company asked us, you have to take as per this, this is a jointly decided by the Konkan Railways, Northern Railways, and 
the construction company with international consultants. So uh, we have to follow their guidelines. So, Professor Fernando, if there is any other question, because uh... Uh, yes, there there are more. There are another of uh, another couple of questions here. One is for uh, from uh, Demelo again. Uh, and he's asking about these coastal water reserve, uh, reservoirs. Uh, what type of geology and topography do you have in the region or in locations where these dams are being studied? <laughs> See, please understand, this is a coastal reservoir near the coast. So it is basically sandy, silty formation are within the ocean. Okay, Across the world, there are already about 10 countries have constructed the coastal reservoir starting with Netherlands in 1932, okay, across the North Sea. Okay, this is, has created a really a new revolution in uh, Netherlands, otherwise it used to have all the time floods. And then Singapore, Marina Barrage is a very classical first generation coastal reservoir. The second is the Chinese one, Shanghai city supplies 70% of the water from the coastal reservoir, Chinkosa Reservoir, and it, they only took two years to construct. So all of these are actually on a sandy, silty sediment uh, at the shallow portion uh, in the sediments, okay? So there is no other geology because it is at the end of the uh, river catchment. So entire catchment would be available to you for storage and today, Second generation coastal reservoir talks about storing off the, not in the mouth of the river, away from the mouth of the river. So that siltation is also not a problem. And only quality water can be diverted to the reservoir. So many other advantages of the second generation coastal reservoir are available. And they are based on uh, the, the Chinese one as really fantastic. I had chance to visit two times the Chinkosa Reservoir, okay, close to Nanjing. So uh, if uh, some of you would like to know more about it, please refer our book. There is a Chinese author itself has written two papers on the Chinkosa Reservoir, Coastal Reservoir, which is called Second Generation Coastal Reservoirs and the geometry and all complete design has been given by them. So it is in LCVR publication 2020, uh, uh, December. There is, a, there is a final question, which is actually mine, if you allow me. And uh, it's directed to both, both the speakers. And it's a matter of constant debate in Brazil. My question is, how do you see the, the public-private public -private partnership uh, for large infrastructure projects? Uh, how Fernando sees that in Brazil and whether it's usual to have these projects in India that's being financed by both the public, public and the private sectors. Uh, uh, well, my opinion is that uh, uh, we need, we need to, to improve this private investment. Uh, but uh, uh, if, we, if we don't have uh, uh, good regulations, we cannot have these private uh, investments uh, for two reasons, mainly. No? The first one is that uh, you, if you don't have a good regulation, you don't, uh, you don't know how how is the price of this investment, the final cost for the population, for the taxpayers, uh, or direct, uh, or of paying direct to the, to the investors. Uh, uh, and the second, the second uh, uh, point is that uh, if you don't have a good regulation, there's no uh, uh, good legal basis for the invest for the private investor to put the money in the in any project, they 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 need uh, uh, security in terms of legal uh, issues uh, to to invest. So uh, uh, of course, is is uh, the, the the private uh, investment is very important, but uh, is has to be very good uh, regulation very good regulations. 
But uh, uh, despite of that, uh, uh, that doesn't mean that we don't don't ha don't need to have a, a government investment. We have we need both. Our challenges in terms of infrastructure is it's very big. We cannot expect that the private sector will, will solve all of them or will have the money to solve all of them. You know, the government has to, to invest a lot still. That's it. Can I, Fernando? Yes, please. Thank you. It's an excellent question. You know, India, India is actually has learned over a period of last 20 years the, the involvement of PPP, and it is actually sector-wise. Sectorially, they are different. Okay, for the right of the highway, national highway, has done a fantastic job in uh, attracting public-private partnership. And also, they are learning over a period of time. In the sense, see, initially, you know, the payback period was 30 years. You know, later on, they reduced it in some project. It depends on the project and the traffic density which that national highway attracts and also the location of it. So I think, you know, Indian uh, agencies have learned a great deal of uh, uh, learning in the involvement of the private partnerships in that. That is why they have also gone into airport construction. Now, most of our airport is being done by private agencies. And then most of our ports are done by private agencies. Okay. Government is basically, you know, looking after the quality and the monitoring and uh, process tendering and revenue generation is also quite, uh, I think, reasonable. Otherwise, people would not have come back. At least in national highways, I have seen toll constructions, toll tolls have really paid off to the many private companies reasonably well because they have been 30 years in that period. So they, I think without that, they would not have come back. So there are, but there are also what uh, uh, Fernando said, also those issues are also there in India. It is not that they are sort of successful in only attracting PPP, but there were a lot of problems. And I think we are learning and uh, the Indian uh, construction industry particularly is uh, learning, but issue and challenges in Indian construction is uh, handling of labor. That's another uh, major issue. And particularly this pandemic has really hit hard on them because they cannot really uh, have them because people are moving, you know, going away from urban areas. So these are other challenges which they have to face. Thank you. So, Professor Fernando, if there are no questions, uh, no, no I don't questions. have there no more no questions. More I think that so, we are done on, uh, let on us our thank side. Uh, Professor uh, T.G. Sitaram and uh, Fernando Laser Lez for accepting our invitation to deliver lectures and they were both the both were the fantastic lecture and uh, almost everyone has appreciated uh, the lecture i have i am going through this chat box so everybody has appreciated that lecture that lectures were informative and uh, energetic both so thank you so much uh, uh, professor sitaram and uh, uh, fernando laser now Actually, there was five minutes break, but uh, I don't think uh, we should go for break because the next speaker is waiting. So now I hand over this platform to Professor Neelima Satyam. And thank you so much for attending this particular session, all the participants. Thank you so much. So shall we proceed with the next lecture? Shall we continue, sir? Uh, what do you say, Professor Fernando? We should start. I, yeah, we should continue. I think. It's without okay. intermission, shall we go? Shall we go straight? It's up to you. There is no problem. Okay. okay. Let's have. Yeah, we have our second speaker, Doctor Chitra. So, uh, so I request to Doctor Mulli Krishna, Professor Mulli Krishna, to introduce our second speaker. Thank you. Hi, good evening to all the Indian colleagues and uh, good morning to all the Brazilian colleagues. Uh, thank you uh, for letting me to introduce uh, our next speaker, Dr. R. Chitra. Dr. Chitra is working uh, as a director at uh, Central Soil and Material Research Station, uh, which is uh, uh, 
division of the of the key new delhi government of india experience in the field of geotechnical engineering uh, particularly uh, uh, in the planning guiding and execution of geotechnical investigation works for river training works and valley projects across uh, about 350 projects not only in the indian india but also including the neighboring countries like nepal bhutan afghanistan and myanmar her interest of research and uh, activities uh, include hydropower development earth and rock field dams problematic soils risk assessment of dams numerical modeling ash containment system fly ash characterization and geosynthetics in water resources etc etc particularly in the quality control of hydroelectric projects and other uh, related aspects she had published about 250 technical papers in various international and national journals and conference proceedings she is a member in the expert committees of most of the dam safety review panels of uh, uh, india and uh, major dam projects and irrigation projects etc she is also a member of various committees in national reputes like uh, bureau of indian standards and indian road congress etc and her contributions towards formulation review and uh, updation of various indian standards are uh, significant and very substantial she is a recipient of many awards from the geotechnical fraternity of her extraordinary contributions to the geotechnical field she was also an executive member for the indian Inst indian geotechnical society and served to the society for the development of geotechnical aspects in the country as a whole with this brief introduction i uh, invite uh, dr chitra to deliver her talk uh, talk on embankment dams and failures please dr chitra over to you I have to make myself unmute and then. Speak. Yeah, I think now you unmuted. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now it's unmuted. Yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for uh, introducing me to this uh, international forum. Uh, good evening to the Indian colleagues and uh, good morning to the Brazilian uh, uh, delegates. Um, first of all, I'd like to say uh, two uh, sentences of my um, institute. it is a central soil and materials station as already said by uh, professor murli krishna that it is working under uh, department of water resources river development and ganga regeneration under the umbrella of ministry of uh, jal shakti and uh, within uh, we are working for uh, um, many uh, every irrigation and uh, water resources project in india and the neighboring countries and um, we have been uh, yes, uh, uh, this organization is established in uh, since 1954 so uh, i am here to uh, talk about embankment dams and failure uh, initially i was given water and tailing dams but i chose to talk about the embankment dams and failures i mostly i will be talking about this uh, embankment dams and its failure uh, presenting with some case histories and i will be ending up with the some of the tailing dams which uh, i have been associated with and failure of uh, tailing dam as well so if we talk about the failures of the excuse me yeah tell me hello the failure causes are because of the foundation de deterioration that may be because of the removal of a solid or soluble materials rock plucking or undercutting foundation instability because of uh, liquefaction slides subsidence fault movements and detective uh, defective spillways may be obstructions broken linings evidence of overtaxing of available capacity or faulty gates and hoist and most of the while erecting the fault gates and hoist the erection of the gates and the hoist itself causes lot of defectives in these spillways so we are even the date with the latest technologies available uh, for the construction of the dams embankment dams uh we are find facing these kinds of problem quite often and recently also we are encountering this problem uh, 
And it may be because of the defective outlets, obstructions, silt accumulations, faulty gates and uh, gate positions and location. Concrete deterioration, maybe it is because of alkali aggregate reaction, which is very common if uh, faulty um, aggregates are used or uh, silicas are used. And maybe because of freezing thawing or leaching of uh, the material from the dam. And uh, failure causes maybe concrete dam defects, maybe high uplift, uplift pressure, anticipated uplift distribution, differential displacements and def deflection, or because of the overstressing. Maybe embankment uh, dam defects are due to liquefaction potential, slope instability, excessive leakage, or removal of solid and soluble materials from the embankment material, or slope erosion. Reservoir margin defects also is encountered because of the perviousness of the material or instability or inherent weaknesses of the natural barriers. So the embankment dam, maybe everybody knows it's of many kinds, maybe earth dam, homogeneous earth dam or modified uh, homogeneous dam or zone embankment dam and rock fill dam as well. Mostly we'll be looking, of, uh, looking at the embankment material which is constructed with the homogeneous material. The earth dam, the first man's engineering structure is the earth dam. The earliest what we can see in the history is uh, from 500 BC to 200 BC. And one of the first earth dam was 17 kilometer long and 21 meter high, contained about 13 million, million meter cube of earth. Earliest Indian dam was from 500 AD, particularly in the period of 1000 AD. I'll show you one of the case which is, uh, uh, which is located in the southern part of India, which is more than 2000 years old. The largest earth dam was constructed 450 years ago. And uh, largest earth dam of old, olden era was uh, 45 high meter high. And uh, the dams are constructed with the single purpose or multiple purposes. And uh, if you see, as per the registered large dam of I cold, total of 59,071 uh, dams are constructed. Out of that, 65% of the dams are earth dams. And next is Rockfield Dam, 13%, and 30% of Gravity Dam, and the rest of it is uh, occupied by this. I've just listed out the dams, which is more than 200 meter high of uh, world's scenario. And if you see the Terry Dam of India comes at this place, which is of 260.5 meter high. And the next uh, highest dam of India, I can say 163 meter high, which is Coal Dam, uh, which is located in Himachal Pradesh yeah, across the river Sadlaj. And if I see, uh, this is a, a repetition slide to Professor Teach Sitaram, but it is the latest one, which is of 2000, uh, 2019. If you see here, uh, total of uh, uh, 5,745 uh, 5, dams are being constructed, out of which 411 is under construction. After this 2019, it, has, it is uh, published every year because of the pandemic. It is not uh, published so far. And the latest one is yet to come, uh, which will be published by Central Water Commission. And out of this, if I had to say, uh, the more, 20 to 25 percent of the land in uh, India is locked with the uh, black cotton soil or expansive soil, we can say. Out of that, if you see the Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh and Gujarat are the most uh, places where uh, black cotton soil or expensive soil are available. If you see here, 38% of the India count is constructed in Maharashtra. Even if you see the under construction dams also, Maharashtra is leading. And next to that is uh, Madhya Pradesh and then Gujarat. And um, total, as per the standards recommendation, totally the expensive soil are not to, to be avoided for construction of the embankment dam. But with the design requirement, we, we can't go for uh, a good soil or uh, transport lease we cannot uh, afford to. So we, we, we are allowing with the design corrections and the construction methodology for uh, the construction of the dam. But we restrict the height of the dam accordingly. So if you see the most of the dams are constructed during 1971 to 2000 and 2004. 
and this is the period the, if you see the world scenario also this is uh, the same as uh, india only and this is the period where most of the dams also failed embankment dams i am talking about failed this is the kalanai a grand anikett dam i have visited recently in uh, um, march this year also uh, for some reason and this is the fourth oldest dam in the world constructed by king karigara chola in the 2nd century ad located across the river uh, kaveri even today only the water uh, is less but it looks the same uh, the height of the dam was 5.4 meter high when it was constructed and 329 meter long with the base of 20 meter but in 19th century by arthun cotton uh, who is called as the irrigation uh, father of irrigation uh, in india uh, he who has improved many of the old dams and uh, he was uh, main key in constructing many new constructions also uh, construction of the embankment dams also uh, so this was raised and the uh, whole of traffic is moving on from moving from one town to the other also is used over the oldest uh, stone dam i can say and this is a dam, uh, we always say the Rockfield Dam is uh, very new technology for the past 50 years only it has been constructed. But this is a dam which was constructed, ninth oldest dam, constructed near to Bangalore. The whole of this lake is giving uh, drinking water uh, to the city Bangalore, which is of the closure of this lake was with the Rockfield material, 230 meter high and 145 meter long even today it is said it, it is it is being functioning very nicely so there are different types of embankment dam it may be the homogeneous dam on the imper impervious foundation or pervious foundation or upstream uh, embankment with the upstream impervious zone on pervious uh, foundation or central core uh, embankment on impervious foundation or uh, central core foundation on the pervious foundation. And the uh, uh, most of the rockfield dams are of this type. And selection of the type of the embankment depends on the topography, geology and foundation conditions, available construction materials, seismicity, and the climate. So the distress and manifestation, the failure may be because of, it may be because of the hydraulic failure, seepage failure, structural failure. Hydraulic failure may be overtopping of the dams, erosion of the upstream surface, erosion of the downstream surface, or erosion of the downstream stone. Seepage failure may be due to piping through the dam. Because of that, many of the dam has failed. I'll just to show you the statistics also. It may be because of the piping through the foundation, conduit leakages, and the structural failure may be because of failure of downstream phase during the steady steepage conditions, upstream phase during sudden start drawdown, failure due to sliding of foundation, damage due to the burrowing animals, failure of dam due to earthquake also. So during the construction, water pressure built up during the construction may lead to a failure of embankment or reduction of shear strength due to thixotropical property may be lead to the failure. After the construction, maybe it is because of hydraulic fracturing or internal erosion or piping, excess hydrostatic pressure due to the rapid drawdown, reduction in shear strength weathering or weathering, uh, swelling of compacted soil, settlement cra and cracking and earthquake forces. So the factors influencing the cracking failure may be because of low construction moisture content, Silts and silty clays with less than plasticity index less than 15 may cause uh, cracking. Steep rock abutments also could cause cracking. Abrupt change in the dam height. Even well, well graded soils, if compacted with less moisture content and composed to do further weathering, also undergo crackings. Cracks formation due to arching. Stiff and brittle material should not be used, otherwise it will, because it will be with the low plasticity, it will uh, lead to a cracking failure. And igneous residual soft soils not to be used. Subsequent saturation also causes important settlements. And uh, progressive, uh, the factors influencing the piping failure are maybe because of uh, 
progressive backward erosion, progressive backward sloughing. Uh, seepage takes place in the form of well-defined water veins, drying cracks, inadequately compacted materials between the uh, embankment and the foundation also causes uh, piping failure and relatively pervious horizontal compacted layers also causes it. Sometimes if we are uh, hurriedly constructing the embankments, then it will lead to a failure of uh, the uh, distress in the embankment dams. So uh, influencing the slope uh, slides, maybe because of the dimension of the dam, may, nature of the embankment material, poor water pressures. So this is a typical embankment dam. Um, uh, this is the crest and this is the embankment dam. This is the uh, downstream slope and what kind of stress it can go to the next slide will show. So it may be the crack, a transverse crack or a longitudinal crack or slide or slumping and uh, it is it may be because of the animals or it may be because of the trees and the bushes, bushes which is grown on the uh, surface of the dam uh, or it may be because of the rodent activity or deterioration of the concrete or the pipes, uh, the compaction around these pipes are not proper, then the conduit will be along this con uh, conduit pipes. There may be the ero internal erosion through this or foundation through the, uh, sorry, uh, piping through the foundation will cause boiling at the downstream side of the embankment. So the, for cracks and slides, maybe only a centimeter or two wide, but uh, usually a depth of more than 0.5 meter means that a serious condition is going to occur. And shallow cracks may be harmless. Maybe it is a desiccation cracks only. All cracks over 0.3 meter deep should be closely checked and evaluated. Cracks may also be a sign of foundation movement or failure, the beginning of the embankment failure or a surface. So we have to be very careful and it, the cracks are to be attended immediately. Longitudinal cracks, it is uh, maybe a sign of localized instability or because of the differential settlement, foundation settlement, movement between the adjustment sections of the embankment or the compaction is not proper. But um, normally it is said the longitudinal cracks are harmless uh, but uh, the extent of the longitudinal cracks, the length and the depth of it is to be seen and then treated properly. And transverse cracks, it is uh, maybe a sign of uh, differential settlement or movement between the adjustment layers within the embankment or uh, the underlying foundation. Transverse cracks is usually a single crack or a closed parallel system of cracks which extend across the crest in a direction perpendicular to the length of the dam. Uh, it may be because of uh, uh, uncompacted area which, which is left uh, unattendedly, uh, which is not compacted properly, which causes the distress in the dam. So internal erosion of the dams, what to look for? We should always look for signs of imminent danger. Muddy water discharging from the downstream side of the dam or from a drain or low level outlet pipe, which may indicate that the dam is failing. I'll show one of the case history which had showed the distress which was uh, left unattended and uh, it failed totally. Uh, sinkholes are, to, are, are not to be ignored at all. And the signs of uh, potential danger is water discharging on the downstream slope of the earth dam or with a few hundred feet downstream from the dam and look for any accumulation of sediment, do, sediment downstream from the discharge uh, and animal burrows are also not to be ignored. And what we have to do if you see in the internal erosion of the earth dam, immediately we have to inform the authority and frequent ins inspection of uh, the structure has to be there. Then only we will be able to identify the distress is happening and that is to be informed. Uh, as far as the Indian scenario is concerned, in most of my experience, say, 
in most of the cases the documentation is not available because uh, nobody want to take the responsibility of it so that is uh, ignored and the devastation takes place so a large new sinkhole more than 20 cm dia is to be um, um, attended very quickly so since the generic causes of the structural failure of the dams if you say it may be because of the project planning site investigation design errors construction errors material deficiencies operational errors design errors conceptual design error itself lack of redundancy failure to identify all loads and load combinations calculation errors detailing deficiencies specification deficiencies and failure to consider surveillance, monitoring, and maintenance. And construction errors, most of the cases we can see the construction errors while we are attending to the quality control and quality assurance of the embankment dams. We see the potential errors and uh, the, the errors, most of the errors, hurriedly everything is constructed because uh, we are the designer is leaving uh, to the uh, dam owners for the construction and the dam owners are depending on the contractors. Uh, so the compaction and every quality control aspect of, especially for construction of the embankment dams, you have to take care of uh, the density, proper density and the proper moisture also. As I said already, the low moisture content will lead to several problems also. And even if it is constructed with the problematic soil with the higher moisture content, that also lead to problem. So the material deficiency while selecting, uh, finding the suitability, ascertaining the characteristics of the suitability of the uh, borrow materials, uh, we ignore many things like uh, shrinkage limits has to be checked and um, the plasticity index are to be checked and if it is uh, the best material are to be used and uh, material to be avoided uh, to be uh, taken into account. So the operational errors, yes, of course. Uh, okay, uh, yeah. Uh, so, as far as the safety inspection of the dams is concerned, routine periodic inspection is required by a trained and experienced engineer from the dam, dam safety organization. At least twice a year, pre-monsoon and post-monsoon, you have to check. Examination of general uh, health of the dam and appurtenant works are required. And preparedness of the dam and hydromechanical structures for handling expected floods. And comprehensive dam safety evaluation should be done once in 10 years. So what kind of geotechnical investigation are required? Typical dam, safe, dam safety investigations include sampling and the testing methods to determine the potential for liquefaction for dynamic stability, seepage and piping, static instability, collapse of foundation soils, cracking, and the emergency repairs and dam remediation activities typically require some drilling component to be done. And possible types and locations of investigations if an failing a distress, the embankment in distress is to be investigated. Uh, we cannot uh, drill at every places. We should look for uh, where to be drilled and what locations. If it is a, a modified zone dam, then it is to be. Uh, we should we should take care that the uh, phreatic line is not punctured. That is what I I can say. And drilling in the embankments often does not provide conclusive data related to seepage and uh, piping problems within a structure. So we we can. Uh, um, uh, try for combinations of many um, methodology to identify uh, the, pos, uh, uh, the uh, distress in the embankments. So where the drilling is, or not, is not allowed, the locations and conditions near and over the steep abutments that create low confining or tensile stress conditions, adjacent to the rock overhangs on abutments, adjacent to buried structures or abrupt foundation geometry change that creates a differential settlement condition and a zone of lower soil stress transfer. Uh, dam course that can experience more settlement than uh, adjacent shells. Dams in very narrow valleys, arching 
keeps full confining stresses from developing. Mere abutments where abrupt changes in geometry occur. In areas where the embankment is subjected to differential settlement due to large differences in thickness of adjacent compressible foundation or embankment soils. So the, the density and moisture uh, has to be checked and you, you, you need not go wait for uh, the um, um, what is said in the standards. You can adopt your own without violating what is said in the standards. You can adopt your own methodology also to uh, find out. This is uh, uh, the density and moisture control test which was done for uh, while the quality assurance and quality control tests were in progress for the Terry Dam, where uh, the, the uh, structure itself in the clay core, not only the clays were used, even in the, since it is a very high dam, tall dam located in a highly seismic area, uh, seismic zone, uh, the top portion of the clay core was mixed with 80 mm of uh, uh, gravels and then uh, it was constructed to add because gravels are good absorbent of seismic forces. So then it, it was added to it and there are many uh, new um, uh, the innovative uh, things which were, uh, which, which were added to for the construction of the Terry Dam uh, uh, in the design as well as in the construction methodology and uh, while uh, doing the quality control and quality assurance check also. So uh, the methodologies can be adopted uh, without violating uh, these are all the water re replacement method which was this is the size of the material you can see this is the shell material. Uh, the maximum of 600 mm size was used for the construction of the uh, rock fill shell material in the Terry Dam. And the embankment materials, the general requirements are, it should be an impervious core material with the recommended grain size distribution. No oversized materials are allowed and it should be totally impermeable. It should meet the requirements of the physical and mechanical properties. And filter materials, it should be a free drain material conforming to specified grain size distribution free from organic or undesirable materials and size, and it should be into the physical and mechanical properties of the requirement. And this is about the rock fill material, which is, which is which kind of material to be used. It should be hard, durable, sound and weathering, resistant to excessive breakage during the handling and compaction operations. It should be a free drain material conforming to specified gradations, and borrowed from specified quarries and riverbed areas, whether it is from the quarries or the riverbed areas, the friction angle is different and the behavior is also different. The breakage factor it comes into the picture. So you have to be very careful while uh, constructing the uh, structure as well as while designing it also. And it should meet the physical and mechanical properties of it. So coming to uh, whether it is a homogeneous embankment dam or a clay core in the earthen rock fill dam, it should be a well-graded material, should be impervious, low permeable, non-dispersive, low erodible, flexible, low compressible, and it, sh it should have good, good shear strength. So the, normally the tests conducted are grain distribution, Arterbox limit, shrinkage limit. Uh, often uh, people ask me why shrinkage limit is required. Um, so, but we the as per our standard, Indian standard, the shrinkage limit is a mandatory test, and we are also from our organization, we make it a mandatory thing to do shrinkage limit as well as the soil dispersivity test also. And if you see the activity index of uh, the particular soil, then we go for the additional uh, uh, special tests for characterizing the expansive soil. And specific gravity, proctor compaction, shear strength, we have, uh, we can do many tests like uh, direct shear, depending on the type of the material, we can do direct shear or the triaxial, but as far as the embankment, is concerned, um, the, the, we recommend uh, from our organization the triaxial test and the long term stability. We, for that, we have to do the um, consolidated drain test 
or C-U-bar test also uh, can be done. But generally what we are seeing in the detailed project reports, the ECS test conducted on the materials or the direct shear test, which has a lot of limitations in it and better to avoid that kind of test and we have to go for triaxial shear test only. And uh, sometimes we get the uh, unconfined compressive shear, shear strength uh, also, parameters also, which is not at all good. That is applicable only to the clay soils, uh, but as far as the embankment material is concerned, uh, that is not recommended at all uh, and that is not acceptable also. And we have to go for uh, one dimensional consolidation, though it is a very small test, it is giving a lot of uh, uh, information uh, um, ending with the compression index, which is uh, uh, useful in uh, uh, determining many pa L uh, parameter cells otherwise. And laboratory permeability and uh, soil dispersivity. In addition to this listed one, we have to do the chemical analysis of the material also, like pH, calcium carbonate, water soluble chlorides, water soluble sulfides, and total soluble solids also which is very, very important otherwise. Uh, in some of the areas in uh, Northeast, uh, mo most of the areas are very acidic in nature. So in that case, pH is very important and uh, we have to look for the reason why it is happening and then give the solution according to it. And in Northeastern part of uh, India, uh, there are many organic soils also where uh, potentially the potentiality for construction of the embankment dams are there, but the materials are not available. So such kind of things also, uh, after a lot of uh, deliberations and uh, thought over it, uh, we are giving solution to it to construct uh, with the uh, organic soil. Uh, it's not highly organic, but uh, uh, we are allowing it also. But if you see our uh, suitability of soil for the construction of the embankment dam as per IS standard 12169, the best material is uh, clay gravels and the uh, organic soils are not allowed. But in recent cases in Sikkim, we are allowing with the uh, soil improvement or stabilization or um, soil soil mixing i can say and uh, yeah it depends on which kind of uh, embankment uh, what is the function of it uh, uh, you are constructing uh, that depends uh, which kind of material you are recommending for so the materials to be uh, avoided totally are organic material decomposing material material with a high proportion of mica calcitic soils fine sills cyst and shales uh, cracking clays that fracture when dry or, and may not seal up when wetted. Uh, sodic soil, sodic soil are nothing but the dispersive soils only. Uh, dispersive soil or expansive soil, uh, expansive soil also because of the sodium monomorphinate so, um, clay mineral and the sodic soils are having uh, the sodium uh, monomorphinate clay mineral only. And uh, if the dispersive soils are used, then uh, sinkholes and the piping failure can occur. And uh, the, there are solutions for using uh, the uh, dispersive soil as a construction material for the construction of the embankment or dam also. We can talk about that also. And the categories of time uh, dam failures causes maybe overtopping, quality problems, poor management, distresses, and others also and straight away i would like uh, this is the list of the uh, reported failures of the dam in india and there are uh, 36 of it and this is the last one which is listed out garada dam i'll show you uh, that case history also uh, it was failed and it has failed in 2010 after that auto also four dams have failed but still investigation is going on so that will be listed very soon and if I see, show you the dam failures in India, uh, 44 dam percentage of is because of the breaching of the failure due to flooding. And 25% is because of overtopping due to inadequacy of the spillways capacity. And 14% is because of the piping or bad workmanship. And 17% is other distresses. 
And if I see year-wise, the dam failure, like I said, uh, 1951 to 60, 10 dams have failed. 2001 to 2010, 9 dams have failed. And state-wise also, uh, here Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh is the la uh, largest dams uh, which, have, uh, uh, which has failed. And this is a data. And in, in India's Indian scenario of dam failures, it's because of poor project planning, poor investigations, uh, poor design, unsatisfactory location or the site selection, faulty or poor construction practices, poor construction scheduling, and poor coordination between the design and construction unit. And the poor documentation also, if a structure fails, if we look for uh, what is the reason of it, it is very difficult to find out uh, the documentation. So starting with, this is a, a embankment on, this is a cutting portion and this is the a, um, uh, construction. You, you can see the failure of this embankment because it was not compacted because it is a cutting portion and they tried to construct the retaining rigid structure, uh, retaining wall to stop the movement of this uh, door. And the, you can see the patches means there are a lot of uh, tracks formed in this because of the swelling nature of uh, uh, this dam. It is located in Maharashtra. Uh, this concrete linings failed. Even the CNS material was used, uh, which is of uh, no use because the swelling pressure of that CNS material also. Uh, later uh, forensic in investigations uh, uh, said uh, it is also the swelling pressure is high. So this is a dam in Karnataka, uh, which is constructed with the expansive soil. You can see a lot of things. And uh, the, here you can see the distress. The, this downstream slope is moving and the tow drain has lifted up uh, here. Even the settlement pillars, it were, everything was uh, inclined. And we investigate the swamp area. It was just a trap for the animals which were coming by seeing the green grass. And we had to uh, correct this by giving a proper uh, drainage system to this uh, dam. The, since this was safe because it is a full, uh, throughout the year, the dam is full, filled with water. Uh, and this is an embankment. Uh, constructed with the one kilometer stretch, the canal itself it is totally you know, 400 kilometer stretch. Um, the benefit of this canal is uh, taken by five states, uh, including Odisha, uh, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, Bihar, and West Bengal as well, Subarnarekha. And because of this one kilometer stretch, this uh, canal could not be in operation. And this was uh, investigated and uh, the total, the material were uh, excavated and uh, a new material were, uh, in spite of uh, treating this special, uh, this material with the CNS material and other solutions were also provided, it was failing and again, uh, then uh, the total material was excavated and the new material were used and the blended material were used. And this is again a classic case of, uh, uh, the delayed project is usually uh, the water retaining structures are constructed, uh, should be constructed one to three years or five years even, uh, but uh, this has taken 30 years of time. And because it is a, a lengthy dam of 4.5 kilometers in the eastern part of Uttar Pradesh and uh, <clears throat> uh, 10, 15 meters of height were con uh, constructed and some portion of it was constructed to its fully full height. And this tow drain was constructed very uh, long ago itself. And after 20 years of time, uh, the construction was resumed. Uh, but the health of the, con uh, the consolidation must have happened here. So the health of the embankment already constructed were to be checked. And since they wanted to complete the structure very quickly, uh, it, the, um, it was divided into many portions and different uh, contractors were allotted for construction of this. And without knowing uh, if we have uh, many closures, uh, you are uh, inviting a lot of problems. And uh, we are ignoring uh, there were uh, uh, rock portions which was coming into uh, the dam axis. 
and they wanted to construct uh, with, uh, with without the disturbing the rock and they have to be careful while constructing on this because it has the potential of uh, failure at this point if the compaction is not proper on this rock so accordingly we have to advise this so this is a, a dam in uh, tamil nadu willington dam which is uh, located uh, near trichy Uh, 60 to 80 kilometers uh, north to Trichy. It had the distress was uh, noticed and the slippage of a slope, sinking of top bend, uh, longitudinal cracks in, in, uh, along the dam axis in, throughout at the center of the dam itself, and the flow of mud at the downstream uh, dam was found. And upheaval of the downstream toe also found and. Uh, so like uh, this and it was uh, uh, con constructed and new sections were provided and you can see on the new uh, this downstream this is uh, upstream four portion this, this kind of uh, longitudinal uh, cracks were there they have to abandon this and then construct uh, this this is the distressed one they have to construct a new embankment surpassing this and this is the section for that and this is the the new section and there also again uh, if the workmanship is very poor then you need to get lot of cracks on the downstream portion of it and if the um, um, uh, homogeneous material is um, uh, is uh, is not covered properly then again uh, the distress you will be able to see it further and this is the uh, this is again a dam in tamil nadu which is uh, experiencing lot of uh, distresses longitudinal cracks and the crest uh, low lying areas and the crest you can see the downstream slope and the slope is moving and again when uh, we are uh, seeing the move, movement of the slope what we do is now suddenly we want to hide what is uh, in distress we are trying to load the cracks and then put uh, soils on it and then uh, when the, the load is going to higher then the uh, slide will be is going to be aggravated that we are we should take care of that this is a, a garada dam uh, 2010 it failed and it is of 4.271 km of 330 meter high which was failed on 15th of august this is the uh, dam uh, which is seen uh, presently and uh, it was taken by me and this is supposed to have a section like this having a clay coat and a, a casing material or a shell material uh, which is called off and the clay material uh, are to be the uh, in, in, uh, clays of intermediate clays and uh, the shell material are to be um uh, clay sands but when we it failed uh, this this is the picture which we could uh, see when we uh, visited it in uh, december 2010 after the failure and uh, we couldn't see this is uh, in true meaning of uh, the homogeneous material we can see on this uh, but uh, uh, what what was uh, the reason of it if when we investigated it uh, the uh, actually there is no the cracks were not uh, treated and uh, there was no sealing of these joints was done uh, the depth of the water in the reservoir had risen from uh, 0 feet to 46 feet over a period of just uh, the reservoir fill there was no control over the reservoir filling i can say and uh, there was no arrangement for the controlling of the reservoir filling the depth of the water in the reservoir had risen from uh, 0 feet to 46 feet and uh, filter arrangements were not there and it was difficult to confirm by the visual inspection of the breached section uh, whether any chimney filter was provided uh, or not and we could see the longitudinal uh, cracks all along the dam uh, in the unbreached portion towards this is the downstream slope and lot of vegetations we could see on the downstream slope as well as an upheaval in the upstream slopes also and when we investigated this is the modified section after investigation uh, was done and initially it was thought of uh, this uh, this dam was constructed because um, constructed with the dispersal soils when we tested it 
uh, it was seen that uh, the material was not having dispersive characteristics. It is mere, and the material which was found uh, entirely on the embankment was of uh, silty clay or uh, the poorly graded sand, I can say. Eh? Uh, silty sand and poorly graded uh, sand and the filter arrangement was not there so we it was recommended that the and the permeability of the embankment itself uh, there were total uh, water loss so uh, the, the, yeah, it was recommended to abandon the structure which was constructed but uh, due to many reasons it is to be modified and the, the entire uh, the downstream uh, uh, slope were cut and uh, uh, upstream uh, groutings were done and uh, upstream slope was also protected and downstream slope with the geosynthetics uh, material was recommended and this is the non wood geotextile and uh, grouting holes also i'm having yeah this uh, the upstream slopes were uh, <coughs> uh, grouted uh, so this is the modified section and this is the non cover dam we it was constructed before 1960 and it failed also in, in uh, 1967 and uh, uh, it was rescued after that but uh, now recently in march uh, we have visited this site and there is the problem of uh, boiling uh, from the downstream side of it whatever we are seeing here is the boiled water and the sediments are not were not coming from this uh, water, but the the color of the water was uh, is was red, and uh, we are investigating that one why it is uh, done. It is maybe because of uh, the um, piping through the foundation is coming. Otherwise, the embankment. This is the dam. This the embankment looks very healthier, but it is coming from the downstream end. Uh, so we are investigating this and we have to find the this. And tailing dams, I'm not uh, talking about what is tailing dams, but it is constructed uh, very uh, sequentially raised with tailing dams. Starter dike is constructed with the original soil and further uh, raisings are done with the uh, tailing material, uh, maybe of any tailing waste material. Oh, it may be an upstream uh, method of construction, it may be a downstream method of construction or center line method. I think the, my next speaker will be talking about uh, on uh, tailing dams. Uh, but I just want to mention uh, the different uh, uh, difference between the tailing the embankment dam used for the storage of water or water re retention or tailing dams. Uh, the function is to retain the water this is for to retain the so, tailing solids and processed water with various contaminant levels. It is runoff water. Only tailing, tailing material will be remaining in that reservoir. And dam section, usually a consistent design. And here the tailing dams vary during the design life depending on the method of the rising and the method of uh, the type of material we are using. And the operation life, Typically, the embankment dams are uh, designed for uh, 100 years or as long as it is required by the society. And uh, the tailing dams are limited operation life, maybe for 5 to 40 years. And construction period for embankment dams are usually 1 to 3 years, like I said. But normally, it is completed with uh, more years because of many reasons. Lean periods are uh, there. And uh, for uh, the construction period for raised over the mines operating time, because uh, as uh, the, the require, required by the industry, uh, the tailing dams are raised. And uh, engineering uh, level for embankment dams are very high and uh, medium to high level for uh, tailing dams. And quality control uh, and quality assurance for embankment dams are high level for embankment dams, generally good for starter dams, variable levels during the construction period for the tailing dams. And consequence of the failure, water inundation damage in the case of embankment dams and tailing debris flow uh, resulting in physical damage and environmental contamination also. So this is the Kudremuk Kudre tailing dam, uh, which I have visited in uh, 
uh, in CSMRS was involved in raising the dam in 1991. And for making a, this is presently, if you go through, uh, this is uh, created as a national park also. Uh, we were involved on that also. And this is a KCC dam, which is a um, copper mine uh, waste are deposited here. We were involved in uh, raising of this uh, dam height. And even today for the closure and uh, making a, a recreation park on this, uh, we are involved in, uh, in today, as on today. And the latest reported failure, from, uh, failure of the tailing dam was uh, 9th April 2019, which is Mori Jarkhan. Uh, the vote type was bauxite and the failure of red mud drilling ponds and the spill of red mud over 35 acres and a nearby railway line, number of casualties. Uh, but uh, yeah, the service uh, road as well as the uh, railway track was also uh, affected by this failure of the dam. This is uh, the photograph. And uh, already the tailing dam was instable. That is why this Gabion walls were constructed to stop it. Still, uh, the movement of the slope was not uh, done. And uh, it's not ending that we are involved in open mine dump site also, which is located in uh, Telangana. This is the open mine dive. Uh, it is like a big dam, uh, dry dam, which was constructed up to a height of 100 meters. And here again, uh, the spreaders are used and the compaction is not the main criteria for this. And above these uh, mounds, um, um, vegetations are grown to and uh, done. And this is where uh, why the, the, you can see the arrangements of doing the plate load test here because this dump failed in 2009. In one of the time uh, dump, which was constructed up to 90 meters high. Uh, this is the Godavari River. And this bed, you can see it's a black cotton soil and the black cotton, so the foundation soil was not tested at all. And uh, this is the service road, which was totally and luckily totally uh, obstructed by this failure. And uh, the 90 meter of this mound came down to 30 meters. And luckily, now even uh, none of uh, human life was lost. Life was lost, but the entire uh, habitants in this portion of this area was cut off uh, from the uh, other portion, and the electricity services were also uh, stopped by this because of this failure. Then the authorities wanted to analyze the stability of the rest of the over dumps because this over dump is uh, located uh, in a very large area uh, especially this ramagundam um, singreni is providing 70 million, million metric ton um, uh, coals to uh, per annum to india so that is why a large uh, uh, wastage of coal uh, waste is uh, created and it is located um, dumped in that so I would like to end with the breach of a ash pond dam. Uh, again, ash pond also is similar to the tailing Madam, dams. Uh, so just to hello, Madam, just to remind you, the time is up. So please. Yes, I'm. I'm completing. That's it. Thanks. And uh, with the conclusion, failure of embankment dams results in catastrophic uh, in, uh, incidents. Um, instrumentations are to be installed in the structure to monitor the behavior of the structure. Good quality control and quality assurance is mandatory during the construction stage to avoid the distress. Thank you so much. With this, I'm completing. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take the lead now. Thanks for your kind presentation. It has raised a number of questions that I'll, uh, that we'll, we'll, we'll consider uh, after the next presentation uh, when going to the section of discussions. Our next speaker is uh, Paulo Ricardo Berens da França, da Franca. Uh, and uh, his education 
uh, started as a BSc in geotechnical engineering that's in Fed at Federal University of Ouro Preto in Brazil. Uh, his role, he held a BSc in civil engineering as well, Kennedy School of Engineering, Belo Horizonte, Brazil, a Master of Science in Rock Mechanics in Queen's University, Department of Mining Engineering in Canada, and uh, a course on stabilization in business management. management. That's at uh, Dom Cabral Foundation, Belo Horizonte, Brazil. Uh, Paulo Franca has a, 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 quite an extensive professional experience. It started in 1986, uh, first as a geotechnical engineer at a mining company, Itaminas, and then as a civil engineer in a construction company, Construtora Guiar. Then he moved to MBR, which is a mining company in Brazil, Minerações Brasileiras Reunidas, uh, where he worked first as a geotechnical engineer and then as a senior geotechnical engineer and later as a manager of the geotechnical and hydrogeologic department. In 2006, he moved to Vale. Vale is, as you know, it's one of the biggest companies in the world, the biggest Brazilian company, mining company. And he worked first as a manager of mining geotechnics and then as the general manager of planning and development at the Southern Metals Division. Uh, in September 2014, he became an independent consultant F at F and Z, consultancy and design. So, uh, Paulo Franca, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and the floor is yours. Please go for your presentation. Okay, thank you, Fernando. It's an honor to participate in this webinar. Uh, good, good evening to my friends in, in India, and it's still good morning in, in Brazil. Do you already see my, my, my screen? Can you see my, my screen? Yes, I can see, but it's not in the presentation mode. Not now. What it's about now? now it's done. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Okay. So thank you very very much. Uh, my talk today, I'm, go I'm going to talk about the, the chronology of the latest tailings dam failures in Brazil, uh, its implications, and the future of tailing disposal in the country. Uh, the outline of the agenda for the presentation is as follows. I'll We'll talk a bit about uh, the chronology of, of the failures that we had in the last 35 years, its implications. Then I'll move to, to the one of the greatest challenges we have, talking about the, the characterization of the upstream dams. Then I'll go to talk about the tailings disposal in Brazil, the way forward, how the mining industry can survive as far as tailings. And then I'll show you an example of, uh, of the largest tailings, filter tailings operation in Brazil and go to the final remarks. So let's then start in 1986 when we have the, the, one of the largest uh, failures causing a environmental impact and seven people died. They were working on the, on the dam. And because of the failure for the first time, an investigation committee was set up by the, by the state government. Uh, this was in Minas Gerais in southeast of Brazil, which is one of the largest uh, pr uh, state pr producer of, of ore in, in the country. At that time, we didn't have any specific legislation nor standards for tailings dam designs. The first one was written in 1993, and there was a code in that, in that initial standard, that upstream dams were not recommended, mainly because of this accident in 1986. I got some pictures here. Unfortunately, they are um, black and white. We didn't have colored pictures. But as you can see in the uh, left uh, up corner, uh, the, there's a person here. Uh, the dam was about 35 meters high. The projection of the crest was, was like here. This is the, the failure uh, scars. Uh, looking from, 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 the, from the top, almost 35% of the total tailings uh, in the reservoir went down to a valley, reaching a major river 10 kilometers away, 
causing a very hard environmental impact. And you see here the remains of, of, of the dam afterwards. Um, so I went to this mining company to work in the rehabilitation of, of this dam, as well as the construction of another dam that was trying to contain all the tailings that were gen gen generated in this accident. Uh, some years later, in 2001, we had another, another dam failure in the same state, uh, Rio Verde mine, causing five deaths. Again, an, an investigation committee was set up by the environmental agency to determine failure causes, as well as to investigate all the dams in, in that same region. At that time, I used to work in a mining company, and I was responsible for the safety of all the dams of the, that mining company, so I was like fully investigated. And because of this particular failure, the first state regulation was created in the state in 2002. And that regulation uh, comprised a dam register system. And the meaning or, or the significance of that was to, uh, uh, under, to know how many dams, what, what was the portfolio of dams that the state had. Uh, the dams had to be classified according to its potential hazards. And then this, this legislation also set up minimum requirements for design, for operation and management, as well as uh, demanded regular safety audits and the frequency of those audits would be based on the dam class and its hazard potential. So this first legislation, uh, okay, this is just a picture of the, of the dam that, that failed in, this, in, this, in the circle here. It was another mining company Besides it, a major uh, road, and you see the valley down downstream with a very significant environmental setting and some communities. Uh, this dam failed all the way and caused damage in the community downstream as well. Uh, it started off by backfilling a pit, and then uh, uh, the, the mining company that operated this, this dam did some upstream raisings above the, the, the the ground drainage level, and this was the portion that, that failed. You can see a picture from the failure at the same day of the failure, which happened on a Friday, 4 p.m. typically. Uh, you see here the, 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 the debris going all the way down. This is another road, and by a, by a matter of, of, of lucky, uh, uh, kids from my school would pass in this road at about the same time, by let's say 15 minutes delay, uh, they, they, they were caught by the, by the flood. Uh, this is the chart uh, of the dam classification that was done at that time. So basically we would consider in a weighted system, some physical characteristics such as dam height and the volume of the reservoir. And then some characteristics of the, uh, of the environment downstream. In terms of human presence, environmental significance, and the industrial presence. According to the sum of the weights, so you would classify the dam as class one, which would have a low hazard potential. And in this particular case, the audit would have to be taken every three years. And, and, and if the summation of the weights were above five, it was a high hazard potential, every year would need a, an, an external audit. So then in 2003, there was another failure. Uh, this was not a mining dam, but it was a, a industrial residue from, from cellulose, a paper company. Uh, and, and, and in the same region, four years later, there was another failure, uh, uh, the Rio Pamba mining, which was a bauxite operator uh, that caused a very huge environmental impact. So that first technical standard that was written in, in, in 1993 was reviewed uh, between those two failures. So, and in, in that particular case, the idea was to set up minimum design criteria for, for, dam, for tailings dam design uh, based on international standards, the Canadian standards, as well as the Australian standards that have had been published a couple of years before. Uh, in that, with, with this new standard, there was no restriction to building upstream dams, as long as their designs were compliant with 
what was said in these standards. So this is a picture of, of both failures. This is the first one, uh, the cellulose residue. residue. So the, that, that failure was like a, a, the spillway was, was not designed for, for a, 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 a great rain. So it, it failed in this right abutment. You see the color of, of the water that went to the river. And, and the ones below are in the, in the bulk side tailings that completely flood a city downstream and in, impacting the, uh, uh, the, the, the water uh, for, for, the, for the city. But hopefully, we, uh, but we didn't have any casualties in, this, in those two accidents. Uh, some years later, then we had in 2014, uh, another upstream dam failure, the Herculano B1 dam, causing two deaths. Uh, the San Marcos Fundão dam failure in 2015, causing 19 deaths. And just after uh, this, this failure of San Marco, uh, the state public prosecutors demanded that all the dams had to have an external audit by independent companies. Uh, but then, unfortunately, in 2019, we had this, this largest one failure, the, the Feijão B1 dam failure, causing 207 deaths, and 10, 10 of them are still not found as, as of last week. So this is the picture of the Herculano dam. It was a small dam, but it was an upstream construction. Uh, the dotted line here shows the projection of the crest of, of, of the dam. And then you see the fellow here, two trucks that were working down here, uh, were, were, were taken with, with, with the flood. You see a dozer turned upside down. And, and some of the pictures of the environmental impact it, it caused. But what was interesting, if I may say that in that case, uh, in the yellow circle, this is the dam that, that failed. The failure took place around this location here of the, of the dam. And, and the, 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 the material uh, slided down toward this, this water dam here and went as down as somewhere in here in this valley here. But this was another upstream dam that had experienced a major sinkhole at the back here. And some cracks as well. This was probably due to a small earthquake in the area that created that sinkhole. Some of the tailings went down. Uh, there's a lens of a marble or a dolomitic material that, that runs under, under the, the foundation. It was such a big uh, hole that I went, that I was able to enter in this hole to investigate what, 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 what happened. But what is interesting in that case uh, this would be a trigger to the failure of this dam, but yet it didn't fail. The other one failed. This is a quite interesting example uh, that it's, uh, you, may, you may have a trigger, but it, if you have all the conditions to satisfy that, that failure, perhaps you, you, you may not have a failure at, as it happens in this case. So this is a picture of the San Marco uh, the Fundão Dam. The dam was located somewhere in this valley here, in this position. Uh, this is the downstream portion of the failure. Uh, it almost uh, uh, failed another dam here, the Germano Dam. And if that happened, the catastrophe would be even bigger. Uh, you, you might have seen this uh, review panel to investigate the causes of, of this, this failure, which was led by Professor Mogerson from the University of Alberta in Canada. One of, of the uh, extracts uh, from, the, from the conclusion of this investigation was uh, initially the dam was planned to, to have a center line type of construction from a starter dam uh, uh, with, a, with a cyclone having the, the underflow building, uh, construction the, the wall, let's say, and the overflow creating the beach. But half away, uh, but during the, the, the operation, they changed the methodology to an upstream type of construction, 
And according to this investigation, uh, a change in the design concept uh, permitted that the uh, saturated material uh, conditions develop in the sand tails here. So again, uh, according to, these, to, to this material, the saturation of the sand, the, the, the loose and compacted material of the sand and a trigger mechanism contributed to having that, that failure. And according to them, the lateral ext extrusion that happened in a slime portion that eventually invaded the sand tailings portion was the trigger mechanism for this type of failure and the, and the liquefaction that happened afterwards. Uh, this is the, the, the Brumadinho one. I believe that everyone has seen this video, but it's quite amazing to see because you, you, you can see the failure as it initiates. Uh, this, this was taken from one of the uh, newspaper company here. And you see the exact time of the failure and you see people running away from the failure debris. 270 people died in, the, in this particular failure. Again, an investigation committee was set up for that. And in this case was led by Professor uh, Peter Robertson. So here is a, a typical cross-section of the, of, of the, the, the B, B1 dam. From my starter dike number one here, the, uh, they had uh, the first two raisins, then a setback and another uh, six uh, or seven states of raising upstream. And according to the panel, they concluded that the uh, a loss of strength uh, that, that happens uh, due to the creep in the foundation had to create all the conditions for that failure to occur in January 25, 2019. So then what, what was the public perception of those failures? Uh, some of the specialists say that people in this state most of uh, those, this, the, those seven cases that I show happened in the same state. And the public perception of this state is like they created what they call the dam phobia, which eventually, eventually is also evolving to, a, let's say, a mining phobia. They don't want a dam, they don't want a mining uh, by their uh, yards. And they are making a lot of demonstrations saying this, this was not an accident, it was rather a crime made by the, by the mining company. And that reminds me of a picture that I saw in the internet that I, I found interesting, which is this one that compares a dam as a, as a tombstone. This was, was in the US in 2004, and, but this is the same type of reaction that the public has about dams and about mining in this state. As far as the legislation, uh, this is a timeline coming from 1986 uh, to, to, to the present days, showing a lot of legislation that has been put, put together. Uh, most of them are reactive to the failures that, 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 that happen. Um, as, as I show here, it's starting with the Ferdinand and Rio Verde failures. We had the first state legislation on dams. In 2010, we have the national policy on dam safety. And after the most recent failures, there's a lot of, of leg leg legislation uh, 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 that, that, that is already in place. And some of them are being reviewed to be more, as, to be more strict. Uh, one of those legislations says that uh, upstream dams is no longer permitted. So, and we have to decharacterize all the existing upstream dams. I'll go, I'll go to, to that in a minute. So in a summary of the current legislation, uh, the mining dams are, are now classified according to, to its risk and hazard potentials. There's some tables uh, that, that you enter to, to verify that, or to classify. So routine inspections by the dam owners uh, are demanded at least every 15 days if the dam is working properly. If not, you have to do that daily inspection. Twice a year, external audits are required. 
If you find an anomaly in your dam, you have to assign an emergency level, and that has to be input in the, in the government system. Uh, emergency levels run from one to three. Level three means that you have an imminent failure. In that particular case, you have to evacuate all the population in the so-called ZAS or self-rescue zone, which is a zone that's located 10 kilometers away or, 10, or 30 minutes of arrival of the flood wave that you model in your dam break studies. Um, as of May 2021, uh, out of the 886 mining dams in Brazil, 42 were in emergency levels, third of them in level one, uh, nine in level two, three in level three. As of last week, one of those in level two moved to, to level three, so we have now four in level three. Uh, all dams also, as part of the legislation, must have an emergency preparedness plan with a warning system automatic in place, automatic action. Uh, 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 that, that, that flags automatically if you have any problems. The downstream population must be trained in this, in this plan, and you have to do drills uh, every three months, if I recall. Uh, the mining company should provide all the resources needed if you, if you have a failure. For, for instance, if a bridge fails as a consequence of, of the dam failure, the mining company has to rebuild the bridge and everything. And as I said, all the upstream dams are now banned and they should be decharacterized. And I'll, I'll define that in the next slide. So we have 63 dam, uh, upstream dams in Brazil. 45 of them are in the Minas Gerais state in, in, in Southeast Brazil. According to the legislation, uh, uh, decharacterize a dam is a dam that does not receive nor tailings nor sediments and no longer has a function of accumulating water and rooting the flood. And it, it must comply with all the safety standards. So then the characterization has a, has a broad range of signification. It can come from a, either total or partial removal of the dam or a geometry modification, a regraded a reinforcement but it cannot no longer work as a dam, right? And there are some requirements. So uh, the design has, has to be uh, well done and, and it, it is needed to have another company doing a peer review of the design. Uh, the, the final design has to ensure that the factor of safety are, are as follow, 1.5 in the drained conditions, 1.3 minimum in undrained peak conditions, in 1.1 in the residual and drain conditions. Uh, uh, you, you can have people working downstream of the dam only if the dam has a red reach this 1.3 undrained uh, peak strength. If not, you can only work with remote controlled unmanned equipment. What we have learned from the failures that the combination of bad construction and operation practice over those, those tailings, which are non-consolidated, saturated, and contractile, has led to this, those failures that, that we see in upstream dams. And that situation was worsened by the high water level in the reservoirs, which basically follow a, a line parallel to the downstream slope phase and daylight above the started dike level. So there's no vertical drainage whatsoever in this upstream dams. And also that lamination within the tailings can create zones with high pore pressures, which uh, if loaded or had any modification can trigger a failure. So any trigger can cause undrained failures and associated flow liquefaction for those dams. So this, as I, as, I, as I showed before, this is a typical uh, uh, section of an upstream dam. And, and basically the water table follows a line like, like that. Most of the tailings are saturated. And, and typically you have, a, you have this, this, this water table, they lighten up here. So there's no drainage whatsoever, even if you have a well-constructed started dam. 
And this is also a picture of a image taken from the, 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 the D1 report. In this particular section here, you, you see lamination of fine tailings and, and coarser tailings. And this lamp lamination is very trick uh, to work with because they can, they can, you can have ponded water levels and this may lead to, to liquefaction, to unsaturated, to, uh, to uh, undrained uh, failures. So the upstream dams that you have to decadacterize are the same, have, have, have this, the same problems. So this process will be as dangerous as the construction and operation of the dams itself. Uh, basically, the, the, the characterization will be done either through removal of the, of the reservoir and the embankment or downstream reinforcement or a combination of both. In the first case, we do have to lower the water table in the tails and we do, and we must have controlled the loss of removal. Any, uh, any vibration or any movement that, that is fast enough can create conditions to liquefaction. The second case also is a, is a, is a trick uh, option. So if, if you have to, 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 to put a, a downstream berm to reinforce the tailings, perhaps we can, we can float the saturated portion and create an even bigger problem. So both options are very riskier. And in, in this case, the use of unmanned equipment is being mandatory. And of course, whenever we have to use remote control unmanned equipment, it's a very, very uh, difficult construction. Uh, we do not have productivity in this type of material. Uh, there's no uh, easy assessment of what, what is being done. So it's not as easy as when you do a, a regular construction. And because of that also, uh, most of the mining companies that have the upstream dams to be decharacterized uh, are constructing uh, downstream containment that we call backup dams uh, that would take all, in case of a failure of, uh, of the dam that is being decharacterized, uh, this downstream uh, containment structures uh, will uh, be able to retain all the tailings that may fail. So this is a, a view of, of one of such backup dams. Uh, they basically are allocated away uh, from, from, from the mine site, from the, from the, from the tailings dam site. Uh, they have uh, 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 under drainage here or, or, or under uh, uh, coverts here that will pass the regular flow. And in case of the failure, they, they will immediately close the, those gates uh, to, to create space for, 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 for the tailings to be retained here and not pass downstream of, of, of the dam. And they are being built as, as fancy as, as this one here, with a rolled concrete. Some of them are, are rock fill type of dams. And, and this has been almost mandatory to do in, in those uh, dams. And if you recall, I told you that we have 63 upstream dams in Brazil. Uh, it would be very difficult to build 63 uh, backup dams uh, to, to, to do all, all this, this job. So what the mining industry has to do now to continue its operation as far as tailing disposal. So it's evident that the, after those failures, the, the industry has to change its procedures and technologies to keep operating. I don't believe that any, any dam will be permitted by the environmental agents in the next few years. Uh, one of the helps that we have is the Guide to the Management of Tailings Facility written by the Mining Association of Canada, which complies with the uh, International Council of Mining Methods uh, that recommends to use risk-based approach, uh, and which includes the application of the appropriate technology and the appropriate uh, uh, practice in what they call BAT and BAP. So the best available technology, which is a site-specific combination of technologies and, and techniques with, with the best available practice, which encompasses the management systems, the operational procedures, the techniques, 
uh, to 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 build to to keep operating. And of course, uh, the BAT and BAP they have to be consistent applied all over uh, the mining uh, life or the tailings uh, uh, structures life from project all the way to the post closure. So we cannot allow this curve to go in this in this direction here. Some of the best available technologies in place, this is not an extensive list, uh, but most of them, the idea is to remove as much water as possible from the tailings. So we can have drainage sand stacks, we can have drying ponds or drying pads, we can use cyclones, we can paste the tailings, we can filter the tailings, and this is this is uh, circled here because it's it's one of the methods that it is being most adopted. We can have centrifuges. There's a couple of examples of centrifuges, and there's a new technique called fine dry magnetic separation that has been tested. This is only the lab uh, 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 test the electrosmosis, but can be important in the future. And as well as in pit disposal, which is not a technology, but it's a good practice to, to backfill uh, exhausted pits if it's, if it's possible. So let's, let's talk about filter, filter uh, tailings stacks. Uh, the drying tail is a matter of energy utilization. Yeah? The finer uh, the tailings get, the, 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 the need for, for higher pressure and higher energy consumption um, it's, it's needed, but we do have equipment for, for that, going from si simple dewatering screens to vacuum filters to pressure filters all the way to thermal dye drying, as I showed in the, the, in the list, the last slide. But my question is, if the processing technology is no longer a problem, but what about the disposal side of the equation? This is where we, as geotechnical engineers, get into the, into the job. Uh, I like to, to talk about that using this graph, which is called the tailings continuum. If you have in the y-axis any uh, uh, variable of the tailings, for instance, shear stress, and in the, in the horizontal axis, you have solids percentage. Uh, with, with a small solid, solid percentage like, 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 like that, you, you are in a slurry phase, and this is being produced by conventional thickeners or, or high-rate thickeners, and you can pump this material with centrif centrifugal, centrifugal pumps. As you increase the solids content, you, you need more uh, sophisticated equipment, better thickeners or deep con thickeners, and you, you would have either a high density slurry or a paste. This is something above 65% of, of solids contents. And you, in this particular case, you, you would have to use positive displacement pumps to, to move this material in your deposits. To a certain liquid limit or, or, or solids percentage, let's say 7%, 7 75% of solids, you now have to use filters. You produce a cake which is a non-pumpable material. It's a mechanically transported material. So this, this graph is called the, uh, the tailings continuum. If I change uh, the y-axis to a, what I call operational complexity, in my mind, we would have a, a curve like, like that. So it's not a big deal to work with slurries. It's only a, only a, 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 a matter of, of Pumping it to the to the deposit uh, gets a little bit trickier uh, when you have higher solids content because the material does not flow as with, with a lower solids content. When we go to the paste, it's a very difficult type of operation. You have to maintain a lot of, uh, of variables in those material. You have to, to keep the viscosity. You have to keep the yield the stresses several items that, that you have to, to take care of and to get a, a, the benefits of going to a paste. When you go to a cake, to a filter, although it's a, it's a, 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 it's a drier material, let's say, but still you do have to have a several uh, uh, 
considerations in your design and your operation to keep operating. It's not as easy as in, as in the slurry type of, of case. And this, this has been demonstrated also by this very nice report done by KCB in 2017, where they plotted uh, in horizontal axis the, the daily tailings production in tons. And uh, uh, in, in, the, in the vertical axis, the difference between annual precipitation and annual evaporation. So, uh, so they are separating now, let's say, the, the wet climates to the drier uh, climates. Uh, for any type of client, climate, uh, the highest production rates of tailings are with thickened or slurry tailings. So you can go up to 240,000 tons per day here in Escondida and, and in Chile. And uh, Big and Canyon here, uh, up over 180,000 tons per day in the US. But as you go to either pace or filter tailings, you are very close uh, to, the, to the vertical axis, no matter, uh, no matter what the climate you, you are working at. The only exception I would say is this one here, in Australia, Carrara, where they, they, they produce over 35,000 tons per day of tailings. Uh, but it's in the middle of a desert in a place that the maximum rain is, is like 300 millimeters per year, no more than that. So here in Brazil, we have over 2,000 millimeters per year in general. If I, give, if, if I make a zoom only in the filter tail inside this, uh, this orange square, uh, again, it's the same, the same thing. So the, the, the largest productions are in drier climates. When you go to the, um, to the wet climates, uh, you are in, in the range below 15,000 tons per day. This uh, blue dot here is the case that I'm, I'm going to show at the end. So this is the first case in Brazil that has been operated with such a rate. But we do have plans to go uh, beyond 100,000 tons per day or even 150,000 tons per day. But there, there are a, a plans for that in Brazil. And in order to achieve that, so those are some of the design and the operational considerations that we must have. So we have to, 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 to find a, a target moisture content for our tailings as we're gonna to have to compact the tailings. And I'm just gonna quote here to not uh, mix the geotechnical engineer uh, moisture content with the metallurgist moisture content. And in some cases, I've seen some confusion on that. I just decided to write that, that here. We do have to compact the tailings as, as I said, and this compaction uh, has the uh, purpose of, of achieving a void ratio that is below the critical void ratio. So we have to size our equipment of compaction. Uh, uh, in some of the cases where we have, uh, when, when, the, when the climate is not favorable, uh, we, we may have out of the specification tailings, so higher moisture contents, for instance, and one of the, the good practices in terms of design is to, to zone the deposit, to have a structural zone downstream where you have to be more rigorous in your compaction, in your construction, in the non-structural zones at the back, uh, as, as long as your uh, stability permits. We have to, to, to consider maximum load rates to avoid formation of excess pore pressures during construction. And, and reduce the potential for liquefaction. We, do, we must have a, an, a very efficient under drainage, and of course, a comprehensive monetary system installed in those stacks. Um, there's also a need, as far as the operation, there's also a need to have a backup system, which is usually a dam. So what happens if you, can, if you are not able to either stack your tailings, or if you have a maintenance problem in your, in your filter plant, so in, in order to not stop the, the main operation, you have to have this backup system. As far as the, the operation, there's a need of a dedicated question assurance, question control team. So this is, this is no longer a mining operation. This is more a civil construction type of operation. Uh, we have to maintain the layer thickness, the moisture content, the compaction rates, 
We have to take care of the runoff and control the infiltration to the pile. Typically, we would do channels to divert all the excess water to our deposit. Uh, as we're dealing with typically non-cohesive material, we have to have erosion, construction, protection. Uh, as I said, loading rates, drainage efficiency, trafficability, especially during the rain season. So these are some, some issues that we have to consider in our designs in our operations. And of course, what we have to know what to do when things go wrong. We can, we can have changes in the tailing behavior during time. We can have excessive moisture because of that. Our under drains may not work as properly as, as we want to. Uh, so we may have excess pore pressure. So we have to address all those things and the observation, observational approach will help us during the, the formation of the, those stacks. So these are just some pictures of other examples uh, elsewhere. Uh, so this is the uh, one tailing spile, and there's a backup dump just downstream, uh, so so that you cannot stop uh, your production if you have a problem in, in your in your stack. Uh, this is a, a a picture from the past in one of the oldest uh, filter tailings deposits in the world. It has over 30 years of operation. And they quoted in their report here, written in 2016, here, that there's a dry stack installation in a high rainfall environment can create day-to-day -day management problems for trafficability and compaction. So seasonal fluctuations are an important consideration in the design of a dry stack facility. And this is a, another case, a very neat pile uh, made with belt press, moisture content is 20 to 25 percent. It's the middle of the desert in the Andes, and and all of a sudden, uh, they found seepage at the base of this deposit, and this is a toxic type of tail. It has some toxic toxicity. So and and, and they quote in their report that dry stack tailings contain significant quantities of water, which will emerge as seepage unless contained or collected. So that means we do have to have efficient under drainage. In this department, um, going very fast to an example of those uh, of, of this largest production tailings deposit in Brazil. This has been operated by Samarco, uh, that replaced its its failed dam by, by this operation. It started in December last year, mid of December last year, during the rain season, and it will be able to dispose 14 million cubic meters of filter iron ore tailings. Flotation only, which is a, a coarser, I can't say coarser part of the tailings. So there's no slimes. It's only silt and, and, and fine sand material in a rate of 20,000 uh, uh, tons per day. Uh, the deposit will be compacted to 98% of the standard proctor. In this particular case, there's no zonation. All the deposits will have to be compacted and, and it will be enveloped by a waste, a compacted waste material uh, to have better uh, uh, resistance to erosion. Uh, we created, as, as we are using uh, mining trucks to build this deposit, we had to create a, a filter uh, or a leveling platform to a certain level to backfill the, the, the valleys. And over this platform, there's a, there's a huge uh, under drain system in a herringbone type. We had to model construction rates, excess power pressure, and we are monitoring those. And this will be uh, used to calibrate our models. So every year we, we run those models again to verify the, the, the behavior of the stalins. And we operate in there with mining trucks, 150 tons, the 10 dozers, and using smooth rollers, 20,000 tons as a compaction device. Uh, this is a picture of the filter plant. Uh, it's a vacuum disc filter. Uh, this is a modular uh, uh, type of installation and we can increase the number of filters. I think now we have six uh, uh, sets of filters like, like that already in place. Uh, the cake that, that's taken from, from, from the disc filters are, is conveyed uh, to a conical pile where it's loaded and it's spread in the tailings deposit. Uh, this is a, 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 a design of the leveling platform 
and the herring bond under drains. And this is a picture of the construction of, of one of those. Uh, so they are excavating the, 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 the material. Uh, we line them with geomembrane so that we can collect all the water and measure that. And then we have a, a, a typical gravel and sand type of sandwich type of filters. Uh, this is a view of the deposit taken from, from, from south to north. The whitish material is the tailing, tailings that is being deposited here. Uh, this is the, uh, the outer slope made of compacted soil, as I said, for erosion protection. This is another view. Uh, you see the valleys here that, that were leveled with this compacted soil material. You see the outlets of, of those, some of the drains here. And, and there's a measuring device over here. Uh, and, and the tailings, the whitish material being spread over here. Another picture of, of the formation of that. This is the typical operation. The mining trucks come, the, the 10 dozer uh, spreads, uh, the, uh, thick, the loose thickner, thickness of this layer is 75 centimeters, and then, and then the, 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 the roller uh, makes the, the rest of the compaction. And this is tested for every layer, for every 1,000 cubic meter of material dozer. Uh, this is, will be the final lay layout of the pile, which will have 140 meters in height in total. So as my final remarks then, uh, the mining industry in Brazil has been severely impacted by the tailing storage facilities failures. We do not have any room for, for any other failure, so hopefully we are done with that. As I said, upstream dams are banned and have to be decharacterized. And this process is as complex as building and operating the upstream dams. It's very risky. We should learn from the mistakes we, we, we had in the past to not repeat them. To keep operating, the mining companies must change their tailings strategy. And however, of course, one size does not fit all. Filter tailings is one option among others. Regardless of the option you, you're going to choose for your for a mining companies, you do need proper care in design and in the operation, always. So thank you very much. This is the end of my presentation. Paulo, thanks very much for your presentation. Very nice, very comprehensive. You, you've gone much beyond discussing just a few examples of failures. You have discussed the mechanisms that were uh, controlling these these uh, these conditions and uh, then going moving to a very uh, broad view of uh, the design of tailing disposal facilities. So that's that was excellent, and uh, it will bring room for many for for discussion and for many questions. Uh, I'll, I'll, I've got some questions, so perhaps. Uh, Again, if you allow me, I'll go and start uh, asking the questions that have arrived. And uh, as we've done before, uh, we sort of uh, uh, share among us the, the leadership of these discussions, myself and Pro Professor Samadaya. So uh, for Professor Chitra, uh, we, had, we had a number of questions, you know, sort of, uh, sort of trying to put them together condensate a number of questions. So uh, one of them was related or some of them were related to seismic dam design principles in seismic sensitive areas. So can you give us a perspective? What are the standards that you follow? You follow IC codes, there are local experience that we can base our discussions. What you can tell us about that? No, actually, um, uh, as per the Indian standard codes, there is a code for 1893. So we follow strictly, uh, India is divided into four uh, seismic zones. 
so according to the zones uh, we are just uh, designing it and uh, purely as per the standardization we follow it and uh, Uh, especially in the highly seismic zone uh, in the himalayan ranges it is subjected to uh, high seismic seismicity area so uh, we are uh, constructing the rock fill dams because rock fill is having a, a very big sizes of up to 600 mm to 1.2 meter uh, uh, sizes of material so um, we say the gravels are good absorbent of uh, uh, seismic forces we are taking care of that and we use the standard uh, codes for designing those okay thanks a lot for that yeah uh paul if i if i move to you paul uh You're talking about this idea about uh, that these uh, the standards in Brazil and the need for decharacterizing these upstream type of structures, and uh, but uh, despite of that, there are many operations worldwide that uh, combine static liquefaction and upstream constructions, and some of these structures are being are being operated by. Uh, major mining companies in first world countries. What is your opinion about that? Can we have these operations safe or these structures they have necessarily be decharacterized? Well, um, I think we do. We, we can have uh, safe operations. I, I know some of the cases. Um, uh, however, I don't think the mining industry is now in the position of of asking for a different approach from the regulators other than taking this, the, those, those structures down. I mean, we are in a very fragile, let's say, uh, environment. So we would have to prove that those, these dams were built in a proper way. And in some of the cases, we do not have the, the history of construction of them. Uh, so uh, I guess, I mean, there is no, no other option right now because of the, uh, of the moment we, we, we're facing. But what I don't think that is necessary is to build an app and a backup dam for every one of the 63 upstream dams. There are cases that are easier. Uh, there are, uh, uh, I mean, it's just a question of a, a, a small reinforcement or changing the slope angles or increasing the drainage or, or so. And, but still, we're in a, in a political moment that, that is quite, bad for the for the mining industries but I, i've seen some case they are operating in, a, in very well uh, we do have the case you, you probably know that uh, in 2018 there was a failure in, in, a, in a dam in, in in australia the cadia dam uh, it was a dam built over tailings and it failed but it did not liquefy it did not run out So it was just a question of them going there and reconstructing, basically because it then was built in a proper way. So we can we do have good experience on that. Okay, okay. Uh, moving back to Professor Shitra, uh, there are a number of questions. These are, are, are questions from the Brazilian community because they are again talking about standards. And I think that I, I would condensate them by asking, Uh, what are the dam safety regulations that are used in, in India in, uh, for existing dams in terms of audits and inspections, inspections? And a following up of these questions would be, what are the factor of safeties that are adopted for design? I code does not establish factor of safeties. There are national codes. What is that India is using as their own standards? Yeah, um, as far as the stability of the embankment dams are concerned, whether it is embankment dam or the earthen rock fill dam, we have uh, standards for the stability to be maintained and uh, the factor of safety for different uh, kind of uh, uh, structures, embankment dams or earthen rock fill dam for different conditions. 
like uh, for embankment dam we talk about uh, the during the construction stability uh, just uh, after the construction is over and we call it as a steady state seepage when the full reservoir level is achieved and when the uh, most of the embankment dams fail uh, during the first reservoir filling only so we have to be very careful in the first reservoir filling we uh, analyze the stability of the dams for first reservoir filling partial filling also so then uh, long term stability and which part of the structure we have to analyze as far as the steady state seepage condition uh, the upstream slope is uh, uh, full of water and uh, the, the phreatic uh, surface line is going to be the structure is going to be saturated for fully saturated of course and the phreatic line is going to be towards this uh, downstream slope uh, uh, slope so we are analyzing the downstream slope uh, end so as far as the start and drawdown also we have to deplete the reservoir for uh, some reason every season it is being uh, depleted uh, slowly and there is uh, levels maintained the standards or uh, dam dso and dam safety um, methods or uh, regulations are available for uh, filling as well as the depletion of uh, the dam also when it is depleted uh, both uh, the um, Mm, upstream slope and uh, downstream slopes are in danger as far as uh, short term as well as long term stability is concerned for many of this uh, all of these conditions the factor of safety is levied as far as the static uh, stability is concerned factor of safety the uh, factor of safety for the static condition and the seismic condition also so seismic factor of safety it should be uh, everybody knows it should be above 1 and for uh, during the uh, just after the completion of the construction it should be 1.5 and it ranges between 1 to 1.5 depending on the uh, because uh, there is different tables we are using uh, right now uh, i will not be able to leave every factor of safety it is there if somebody wants to know they can mail me and i can give them their uh, the answer uh, send them the uh, regulations which is adopted in uh, india uh, indeed if you can if you can uh, separate out a number of important regulations and send to the brazilian society we can make them available because uh, a lot of people are actually uh, uh, asking about that, and they would be very excited, very interested about looking at this material. Yeah, we are having uh, one more thing I would like to add. For uh, we have the checklist for uh, maintaining the dam safety uh, re regulations, also maintaining the dams, also. So those checklists also I can may make available with you. I can send you. Uh, you can send Excellent. me a mail. Uh, my email id is chitra009 at the rate of gmail.com you can just note down and you can mail me i'll be very happy to share these documents with you excellent thanks a lot thanks yeah. a lot for that professor samadayo i i've got two other questions shall i make them and then i pass to you yeah yeah no no you you can go ahead i can go ahead okay so the two, two of them uh one is for for paul again uh paul people were asking about decharacterization once again, but now asking if there is international experience reported in them decharacterization that they can uh, use as a basis for their own design. Uh, yes, 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 there, there, there are some, uh, I've seen some dams in Canada that have been uh, decharacterized and so there are different type of dams. But if you go, for instance, in the uh, the uh, uh, bio sands in, in North of Alberta, there's a lot of experience on that. Uh, it's more related to the closure of the tailings facilities, which is basically the same type of approach. And there's a, there's a couple of examples all over the world, yes. Okay, it would be again very interesting to share with us later on. Uh, oh, yeah, Maybe, yeah. Yes. Our, our main. Uh, just, just continue. That. Our main issue here is how to lower the water table within the tailings. That's that's the main issue, and and this is the most difficult portion, in my opinion. Absolutely, absolutely. 
A final question is uh, to Professor Citra, and that's a more specific question. And uh, it's been asked, uh, it is understood that you have mentioned that most suitable soils for an embankment dam is uh, a GC material, a clay gravel material. In your experience, wouldn't these materials be too stiff for embankments? Um, yeah, um, I would like to start with one correction, Professor Fernando. Uh, I'm not a professor. Basically, I am a government uh, 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 practicing engineer working for the government of India. Uh, so I don't teach much. Uh, whatever experience I'm gaining through my uh, career, I'm sharing. That's it. And coming to the best material for the construction of the embankment dam, clay gravels, we are saying that it is a best suitable material because it has got gravel as well as clay also. Because it will have a good permeability. We want the embankment material to be uh, impermeable. So the interlocking between the clay and the gravels give you a perfect um, uh, permeability for an, uh, the water retention structure and stability as well. Clay itself, if you use it, it may lead to a lot of problem like piping through the dam body as well as through the foundation also. You will not be able to maintain that much of permeability. And the, the more the clay is going to be, the more instable the structure is going to be. So for adding the stability to it, you have to add the gravels. So the interlocking of gravels and the clays makes a structure very stable. I think uh, this much is enough. And um, yeah, the other properties like you will be able to compacting only the clays will be very difficult. And the compacting density for the clays is very low and the uh, moisture is going to be high and the kind of uh, rollers you will be using for compacting the embankment uh, and the lift thicknesses you have to maintain for compaction that is very difficult in case of this and if it is a clay gravel then it will be very good for maintaining a good density as well as a moisture content that is what the step for stability point of view clay gravel is the best i think i am able to answer this question uh, well yeah thanks a lot for the answer the only thing that i can tell you is that i'm still teaching a lot so <laughs> <laughs> uh, when people call me professor, there is a reason for that. My apologies. Thanks a lot for the, for the speakers, for their presentations and their very straightforward answers and clear answers. And I hold to Professor Samadhaya for closing the section. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor Fernando. Now, it has been a very good session in which uh, uh, both the speakers talked about the uh, dam failures. And there is one question, if uh, Dr. Chitra can answer from uh, Professor Devasis Bandopadhyay. What are the retrofitting techniques for failed old ash dam in India? Yeah, that, that depends on uh, what kind of stress failure it has happened. Uh, like uh, I said about the dam from uh, Rajasthan, uh, 100 meter of the closer section only failed. But when we investigated the unbridged portion, it, uh, we, we found it uh, the imperviousness is not there. So we have to uh, renovate, uh, abandon the entire 4.5 kilometers and then go for uh, an uh, alternative uh, structure. Uh, but uh, because of many reasons, uh, we had to uh, rehabilitate or renovate that existing structure, having many uh, remedial measures, like uh, upstream uh, slope also, we have to provide uh, uh, bo, uh, geo, geo, geo membranes and the non oven geo, geo textiles in, on the upstream phases as well as in the downstream phases as well. Since filter was not 
provided and uh, non human geosynthetics were provided and then um, above that um, sand filter material was also provided and then uh, the embankment was to be completed and again question was how to close it uh, the problematic one we have to chip off both the sides and then reconstruct it and we have to make a, a proper bonding actually as far as my organization concerned the design is done by central water commission and we are also consulted for that design so we we had to do in that way if it is a piping uh, erosion like in one of the rajasthan dam in rajasthan only one um, uh, embankment dam failed and that um, that was due to the piping through the dam body that is to be renovated by uh, uh, compacting with the additional mem uh, membranes and the, the sink holes were to be compacted again by after depleting the reservoir and uh, this is for uh, embankment dam is concerned and uh, Uh, as far as the uh, boiling which is experienced in the downstream end of uh, the embankment is concerned we have to uh, uh, give the remedial measures on the upstream portion and the reservoir level and sometimes the depleting um, the reservoir is uh, not at all possible as um, as far as uh, like uh, nanak sagar is concerned we have to find out a solution for that and we we also see for whether it is because of the problems in the soil or problems in the structure uh, design that we look for or accordingly we provide it and if uh, i'm sorry to interrupt in between dr chitra uh, yeah. actually this meeting is about to end because it was scheduled till 9 o'clock okay so if we want to extend this discussion can we have to join again the meeting no i no, no I, it's okay we can I finish think, it so okay, i think i am i have answered uh, some uh, okay okay let us conclude although there are two three questions for uh, uh, paolo franca as well as dr chitra also but uh, so it, it has been uh, uh, already we are half uh, half hour uh, half an hour past the schedule time but uh, thank thank you so much all the participants as well as all the speakers and uh, uh, they have agreed to deliver lecture in this particular webinar so thank you so much so let us say goodbye good day to remaining uh to the brazilian friends and good night to all the uh, <laughs> indian uh, participants thank you so much for participation in today's uh, proceedings thank you so thank much thank you so much for giving me the opportunity sir thank you so much okay okay bye bye so bye. we'll meet tomorrow tomorrow at 5 5 i pm indian time 8:30 brazilian time 8:30 brazilian time Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, okay.